You are watching Co-op for Two, broadcasting live from Champaign, Illinois, Tuesday, January 3rd, 2022. It looks like I have the brightness a little high here. Let's switch away for a second. Okay, I'm back. This looks a little bit more natural. Um, thank you for joining me. We're here to play our last session of the Queen's Park Affair, the 1984 expansion for Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, reprinted in 2017 by Space Cowboys, a subject we will return to in the course of this stream. We have played now... I believe about 42 hours on the Queen's Park Affair over the course of eight days, eight sessions or so, with one break off for New Year's Eve. And this now rivals the longest session, the longest series on this channel. And it's up there with Adventures by Gaslight, which is behind me, the yellow box there. The other Sherlock Holmes consulting detective, big giant, continuous case. I thought this one was going to be shorter and simpler. Based on threads I've seen on Board Game Geek talking about Adventures by Gaslight, I've seen Dave Neal and others say, "Ah, oh, start with Queen's Park. I think we're going to talk about that. This group who has played... Adventures by Gaslight with me, some of them. We might have some difference in opinion on where to rank these and the difficulties. But one of the longest, most complicated cases we've played. At the end of our last stream last night, after seven hours, we had read the entire clue book. We had finished all four game days. We had been everywhere, used up well over our allowed time, and then gone through the book and looked for any important clues that we missed, and actually found one big one, unless it's a trick. But we have now finished playing the case, but we have not submitted our answers, but we've read our answers. So, here's the game plan for today's stream. I haven't given away any spoilers yet. I won't until we start, but this... Today's stream will be full of spoilers, we'll give away the solution, and we'll be talking about the solution and then talking about the entire case. So if you haven't played this game and you think you might want to play it, you should stop watching before we get started. You can actually pick up the original for 30 bucks on eBay, it comes up for sale quite frequently, and you can pick up the new box, the Carlton House and Queens Park Murders, which is there in blue for 40, 50 bucks. So there's no reason for you not to play this game yourself. If you haven't already, you can stop watching this stream before we get started, play it yourself, come back. It won't take you 45 hours. And then you can watch how we did and compare and leave comments. I'd love to hear if people are watching this after the fact, after we stream it live, I'd love to hear what you thought of the game. You can also comment on Board Game Geek. I would read it there or on our the Guild Forum on Board Game Geek for this channel, which you can find a link to on the YouTube community tab. Okay, so here's what we're going to do today. We're going to start by looking back at the questions and talking for a bit about our final guesses. And everyone will get in their official guesses in the channel. I've got a couple emailed to me. I've got my final guesses. We'll talk about it. We'll sort of try to convince each other, and then we will open up, read the solution. As I understand it, there's going to be a short solution page with answers to the questions, and then there's going to be a longer two-page epilogue, which we will read. I don't know how long we're going to spend debating our theories. It sounds like everyone sort of slept on it, thought about it, but we can spend as much time as we want talking about it, trying to resolve it. That's part of the fun of these cases, is chewing on the final questions and worrying about getting them wrong. So that's what we'll do first. Then we'll read the solution, and then we'll talk about it. We'll talk about what we thought of the solution. We'll talk about, in general, 
the entire experience, the entire case, what we liked, our favorite parts. You might be thinking about these, making notes to yourself if you've played along with us. Favorite parts of the game, the story, the mystery, anything. Least liked parts. We talk a little bit from a game design perspective, any lessons we've learned, maybe compare this to Adventures by Gaslight and some other Sherlock Holmes consulting detective cases. And then at some point in there, either before or after that, we will get out the Space Cowboys version, the version we didn't play, and take a deep dive into that and look at some of the differences. We might pick out a few clue points to compare, see how they differ, look at how the questions differ, see if the answer differs in any way, try to solve the mystery of why in the Space Cowboys version there's three days and in the original there's four. What did they do to get from four days to three? Did they make it simpler? Did they just combine all the clues into three days? We don't know, but we're going to dive into it. Now, there may be someone on the channel now, in the chat, who stopped by because I posted on Board Game Geek that we were going to do this and compare the versions. So there may be someone in the chat channel, let me know if there is, who has played the Space Cowboys version, hopefully recently enough to remember it, but hasn't played the old version. So if that's you, and I'd love to hear from you here, uh, obviously don't tell us any answers yet, but I don't know how much you'll want to stick around for our discussion of the older version. It would be great if some of the people who played the Space Cowboys version uh, were here when we were looking at it and comparing it, and maybe we could compare notes after we find the solution. I'd love to hear any differences, if you've observed any. Um, and we've got one or two people in the channel maybe who've played this old version and want have been waiting for a week for us to finish it so they can talk about it. AJ Hunter is the one I'm thinking of. Um, and then after this stream finishes and sometime in the next week or so, I'll try to record a concise spoiler free review of Queens Park Affair just like I did for Adventures by Gaslight, and maybe we'll try to post some suggestions for playing it. I think we do have some suggestions. I made a whole video about how I would suggest you play Gumshoe, but I think already someone has asked on a different YouTube stream my advice for how you would play this case and handle the time mechanic. And I think we have some thoughts on that and some advice that differs from the advice that's been given on Board Game Geek. So, and then maybe if we have time at the end of this stream, we'll talk a little bit about the three movies that I assigned as homework during this case, which is The Big Short, To Live and Die in L.A., which I watched this afternoon, rewatched for the third or fourth time. I still love it. Uh, Big Short, To Live and Die in L.A., and Before the Devil Knows You're Dead. All right. Let's catch up with the chat and get started here. All right, so Jonathan and Anna are already going over their theories. Let's look at our questions. So this is the time to tune out now if you think you might play this on your own, because we're about to look at the final questions, which we've already looked at last stream. But if you're just joining us for this one, you should leave. You should watch the... First episode, although this might be a good time to mention Netflix's Kaleidoscope series that you can watch in any order, there have been some interesting papers published saying that spoilers don't really hurt your enjoyment because you just enjoy it in a different way, seeing how the pieces fit in if you know the end. So if you wanted to start here, who am I to tell you not to? All right, let's look at our questions here. We've got, who is responsible for Franklin Kearney's disappearances? This was the case that started this whole thing and the one that we're least sure that we understand the answer for. We start a draft answer was Kearney on the run. I think we might actually have changed our mind on that by the time we got to the end of yesterday's discussion. Yesterday's discussion ended at after seven hours at 6 a.m. And I we had the first occasion it's not happened before on this channel where i was like okay time to wrap up and jonathan and anna were just sitting in the chat trading theories still talking about it 
So that was kind of fun. Okay, so who is responsible for Franklin Kearney's disappearance and why? So we have to agree on that. I have some answers by some other people, and I have my final answers. We'll talk about it. Did Ormond murder Cole? And then what happened to Ormond? So this was the other one we weren't sure about. And then we were more sure about this one. Who stole the Balfour jewels? We said that Jabez Balfour, after interrupting the Moriarty thief, was who was trying to break in and steal his papers. We got that... And near at the very at the end of yesterday's stream, when we chased down all these jewel safe cracker thieves, when we chased them down, we had already decided that Belfour faked the burglary and stole his own jewels. But what we found out at the end of yesterday is that actually a real jewel thief was interrupted. A real safe cracker was interrupted in the middle of breaking in. And he was sent by Moriarty to get Balfour's papers, probably to expose him. And then when Balfour saw that the safe was damaged, someone was trying to break in, and the cops had been called, he realized this is a perfect opportunity for me to get some money that I need. So he took them as an inside job. What happened to them? We know that Balfour's man, Colin Kennedy, tried to... Balfour arranged for Colin Kenny to bring them into Lambert's jewelry shop to pawn them. And that an inside man at Lambert's, Johnson, Leland Johnson, tipped off two criminals, the Mills brothers, and they pulled this inside job at the jewelry shop, ended up killing the owner, Jocelyn, stealing the jewels. And then Colin Kennedy, the big boxer who they hit on top of the head and stole the jewels from, went on a rampage to find them found all three of them, killed two of them, broke their fingers to get information on the third, tracked down the third to his girlfriend's house, nearly beat him to death, broke his jaw, and got those jewels back for Belfour. That is one tough guy, the Colin Kennedy, and now he's off to Dublin with his fiance. Um, okay, who killed Leland Johnson? This is Kennedy, the boxer. Why to get information? Who killed Leo Mills? Again, Colin Kennedy broke his fingers and killed him. Same thing with Leland Jones. I suppose we were pretty cavalier in answering these. You let me know if you disagree with me. But we didn't really pay too much attention. It's theoretically possible that if we really read those clues, we'll find out that Colin Kennedy broke their fingers and tortured them threw Leland Johnson out the window, but then Moriarty's men came and killed. Nah. We don't think the jewelry robbery people are, are associated with Moriarty. They just, everyone here from Belfour to the robbers are all just taking advantage of the circumstance, like the opportunity. It was pretty, well, okay, let me not get sidetracked. Okay, Lloyd Perkins was in the employ of what two people? Well, we figured this out eventually that Lloyd Perkins was a mole. Actually, Anna figured this out quite early, but we got conclusive proof that he was working both sides. But he was a mole for Moriarty, providing encrypted ciphered notes to Moriarty, reports about Belfour's activity and helping plant articles in the paper about Belfour, and he was shot dead in the head, made to look like suicide in the middle of delivering one of these reports. We eventually did decrypt his message, which was pretty cool, and Tina solved it, and I solved it as well. But then we get to a question that we're not 100% sure of about who killed Lloyd Perkins. We think it was probably Brandon, Sir Brandon Mills, a.k.a. Brandy, who we know Lloyd had a meeting with at 11 a.m. that day. And Brandon Mills is part of the Belfour group that Lloyd Perkins was spying on, being a traitor to. However, there are some reasons to be concerned about this answer and some alternative possibilities. I'll tell you when we go over our answers why I think I've settled on Brandon Mills. But we've got some options. We got some alternatives for a couple of these. Then who sent Holmes the Vincent Derrick letter? This was a little bit of a side case that we can talk about not being 100% satisfying. It was very cool, very compelling, but it didn't really wrap up. But we think Rose Derrick, the daughter who suspects her stepmother of orchestrating it, was trying to get us involved, get the case reopened. And so she forged 
the letter from her father um, to compel us to investigate it. And then who killed Peter Northrup? We think we understand that pretty well. We think that was Johnny the Jackal who worked for Moriarty. That's what these two questions are. Who gave the order and who did it? Johnny the Jackal is this real psychopath who garrots people and uses thumb screws on people and scalpels up people. And we think he also beheaded Roger Ormond. We can talk about that in a minute. Now, where are the counterfeit plates hidden by Peter Northrup? Well, we settled on the idea that they're in the Royal Mace, which is pretty cartoonish, but that's where Peter Northrup worked, and he was tailed for a while after the plates went missing, and so that's really the only place he had to hide them. Not a great hiding place, but at least he doesn't have to carry them around with him. And then we get back to the original uh, event that started our case off, which was this smoke bomb that occurred at the cricket match. We know it for sure it was a diversion to get help Northrop escape. And we're pretty positive that Moriarty must have planned it because Northrop is a Moriarty man. We know that the Northrop fiance, the wife, is being paid by Moriarty, given money. We know they're part of the Moriarty gang. We think that Moriarty is seen talk Moriarty's right hand man, the jackal maybe is seen talking to Northrop after he breaks out. So every and we see James, your friend James mentioned in the wife's breakout letter. So everything points to Moriarty doing that. All right, so now let us talk about the ones that we that we have questions about. I think we all agree on these. Actually, let me, does anyone disagree on the ones we're sure about? The ones we don't have questions about? So leaving aside the Ormond murder and Kearney and who killed Perkins, do we have any disagreements from people who are playing with us, not people who know the answer? Does, do we have any disagreements about any of these for those? Let me see in the chat if anyone disagrees and let me see Shay sent me her solutions okay who stole the uh Belfort stole them yep same oh I guess I can put these here here are some of Shay here's Shay's answers here it sounds like who stole the jewels Belfort same what became of them? Oh, one of the things I didn't go over here is we said who killed the Jocelyn? I didn't go over this. Who killed Jocelyn, the Lambert store owner? Well, this was actually quite fun because based on the witnesses telling us one guy had a burned hand, one of the two robbers that came in had a burned hand. He waited by the door. The other one shot him. We actually could figure out which of the two Mills brothers it was. And we know that that's Don Mills. He's the fancy dresser who got his job broken. He didn't get killed, though, so he should consider himself lucky. Okay, so Shay is agreeing with all of this. This. And then I'll leave aside the Perkins questions. Peter Northrup, Johnny the Jackal, Moriarty. Moriarty did the smoke bomb. Okay, so where are they in London? Hidden in the uh, the royal um, what is it called now? <laughs> I've forgotten what it's called. Mace, the royal mace. Yes, the royal mace. Okay, so all agreement here. Um, and then Shay actually adds a fun little story that she thinks that the explosion that. Jonathan and Anna thought was going to come on the fifth day didn't come, says, I also think Moriarty was planning to bomb the Tower of London to retrieve the plates. We saw lots of activity by cabs down at the Tower of London. And this is a very fun idea from Shay, a little bonus epilogue thought. Okay. And... And it's saying no disagreement, but it's not Brandon Mills, it's Brandon Miller. I've got it spelled wrong. All right, Anna says no disagreement. 
about those so far. John says, that's a bonus. The cricket match bomb might scare the Balfour group a little bit, but the main reason is to spring Northrop. Okay, so it sounds like everyone in the channel who's here is in agreement with those easy answers. Now let's talk about the hard ones. Let's leave Frank Kearney for last. I think that's the hardest one and the one that started the case. So it's fitting that we save that for last. Okay, let's talk for a second. Let's work backwards. Uh, anyone, ha there's no other place that the royal, that the plates could be hidden. So I think we basically have got the royal mace as our only potential answer, really. I mean, the other likely place would be that it was in his house or at Hyde Park, but we went there, we didn't find it. And the police would have torn apart that house and found it. Okay, so let's just consider that one locked in. Now, who killed Lloyd Perkins? Lloyd Perkins is a strange character. And in fact, I started to have doubts about whether those weird entries we heard in the park and we read that one of the entries, there were two entries in park that were seemed so bizarre like tricks. Actually, AJ says it's Sir Miller Brandon. Okay, well, we know who that is, Sir Mil Brandon, Miller Brandon. Okay, now let's go back to uh, Perkins. Well, there were two very bizarre entries in the park that seemed like they were tricks on us. One, we found a body hanging, and one, we had to say some weird code word that seemed totally out of nowhere and like a joke, but then we found another clue that actually told us why we used those weird words. And in one of those, it said that Lloyd Perkins stole the jewels for 700000 and uh, the Jabberwock was responsible for the body. And when we read those, we thought, okay, that's the game playing a trick on us, because Jonathan Warner even mentioned that he had read somewhere that there are some trick entries to discourage you from just randomly going around. But when I was thinking about it, I was thinking, those are the only entries that seemed like trick entries, except for this weird one with Luella, which we'll talk about. But um, we know that Picker is a real prankster. And we know he treated this whole thing as a game, that he was spying, he was using ciphers. And I started thinking, is Picker playing a bigger role in this stuff either a bigger role in some things, or is he just playing the jester in some of these things? So were those two entries we read from the park that were nonsense, were they not nonsense written by the game designers as fake clues, or were they real things that we really saw, but they're pickering behind the scenes having a laugh on us because he's such a prankster? And so I think I'm not I'm not saying I think Pickering stole the jewels. I'm just saying I wonder if those leads that we saw in the park were planted by Pickering as fun little things to play with us. And that maybe that helps explain what happened to Kearney. Like maybe Picker is this real jester uh, character. Um. Ennis says, Perkins was dead by that point. By what point? By the point time we saw a body hanging from the room? That he could have set up earlier. I was even thinking, is that Ormond? Um, but, but, but let me put this aside for a second. What I, uh, what I was trying to say is that Perkins is a bit of a wild card. So let's consider, though, our theories of who could have killed him. Our... Current guess, our best guess, seems to be Brandon Miller. Now, why do we think it's Brandon Miller? Let me get my solutions. Here's what I wrote for why, why Brandon Miller is a good suspect. First of all, for Brandon, Sir Mil, Miller Brandon, whatever his real name is, first of all, we've got good, possibly good motive. The only really good motive, because if... Picker, if Lloyd Picker was spying for Moriarty and they discovered it, 
it would make sense that the Balfour group would kill him off. So that's a pretty good motive. However, we haven't seen any evidence that they did know that he was the mole. That troubles me. I would have much been much happier if there was some evidence that they knew Lloyd was a mole. So that bothers me. Then we've got a timeline match because we think he had an appointment with Brandy at 11 a.m., which we think he was killed between 10 and 1. So that's a good match, although we haven't tracked Sir Miller Brandon's movements. We haven't been able to get him down there. We checked hard for the cabs. We could not find any cabs going to Perkins' house. The real thing for me that has made me think... Uh, Anna says they might have suspected a mole because of the leaked info in the papers. I think that's a great point. I was thinking that as well. The fact that this leaked information was in the papers does make sense that they would think there might be a mole and all the stuff that's going on, all the dead bodies, they're probably getting very paranoid. So I do like that idea. I just would have liked some more direct evidence about it. The one thing that I really like or the one little subtle thing that makes me really think it was Brandon, is the fact that we're told by the, I think it was Scotland Yard, tells us that Lloyd Perkins' boss says he's been depressed recently over a woman, a lost love affair. I think they say explicitly woman. Well, we know he's gay, so there wouldn't have, that can't be true. But then I was thinking, maybe he doesn't say actually a woman. Maybe he does say about a love affair. Um, but we, we've talked to people who said Perkins was in a great mood. He's in a jolly mood playing tricks on people and stuff like that. So that makes me think that Belfour's group did it because why would they lie about that? Why they're lying about it because they're making it look like suicide and Brandon, Sir Miller, Brandon shot him and made it look like suicide. So now they're adding to the fact that. They're adding evidence to that by saying, oh, he's been depressed lately. Whereas if, Brand if Miller Brandon walked in and found Lloyd Perkins shooting himself in the head and they didn't do it, he would be telling police, hey, this guy was in a great mood. He wouldn't have killed himself. You got to find the killer. So that, that's what seals it for me to make me think that it was the Belfour group and therefore... Sir Miller Brandon. Although, I suppose you could also say, well, if they had figured out he was the mole beforehand, maybe they'd send a real killer to shoot him, not Sir Brandon Miller. It troubles me that we have got no evidence of violence for Brandon Miller, for Miller Brandon. We've got no gun. We don't know anything about him. He is suspicious to us. He doesn't want to talk to us, but... It troubles me that we have no evidence that he's a shooter or a killer, and this is a pretty bold thing to do. We do have some other candidates, though, that also trouble me. One is, we've seen Moriarty's killing off some of his own men, Peter Northrup. He could be trying to clean house. On the other hand, it seems like, and he did have an appointment, possibly, to collect the report. So we did, the jackal is our killer, our hired killer here, and we did find a gun in the jackal's apartment. That troubles me a little bit. On the other hand, it seems like they would want that last report, and if he always collects, if someone always comes from Moriarty to collect the cipher report from uh, Picker, which is in our evidence here. Um, so if the jackal is the guy who always comes and gets the report, or if he always has the report to be picked up by Moriarty's men, it seems like that they would get that, that they would know to look in his hand and find that. So the fact that this was left on the body makes me think that it wasn't Moriarty killing him. Moriarty would have taken the last report. And if he's still working for Moriarty, writing Moriarty reports, that would be a reason. Then you wouldn't want to kill him. You'd want that information. So that's not so convincing. The other thing that's a little tempting, though, is Johnny Apollo, the boyfriend. 
Why is it a point a tempting? Because we know he that Johnny Apollo is maybe pressuring Lloyd for money. It says Johnny wants 50 pounds. And then we're given that weird clue about a drawer that doesn't even have any dust in it, which makes me think maybe someone came and took the money out of the drawer. I can't tell if that's a total red herring, like a closed drawer with no dust. Maybe that's what you expect from a closed door drawer. So I don't know. But then we find Johnny, his eyes are all bloodshot. But then there are some comments by Langdale Pike about acting and putting on an act and affecting like it's hard to tell when someone is. Johnny Apollo didn't really look like a real tough guy, but mm, I could at least imagine a, a, a possibility that he got killed and no good evidence that he didn't kill him for his money. I still am going with Brandon Miller, but it's an interesting idea. All right, so does anyone want to say something different than that Miller Brandon killed Lloyd Perkins. Do we all agree? Are we all guessing Miller Brandon or does anyone want to take a different shot? Let me see what Shay says. Shay says. This is a. Does Shay have any answer here? Where are the plates hidden? Who killed Lloyd Perkins? Okay. So, Shay has a different answer. Shay says, I think that Johnny the Jackal killed on Moriarty's order as he most likely found out he was a double agent and was about to give Sherlock Holmes information too. That's pretty, that's a pretty clever observation that Lloyd Perkins is talking to the cops. Of course, he's talking to the cops about Belfour, which makes me think he was doing it on Moriarty's instruction. But this is pretty clever idea that Johnny the Jackal is the guy with the gun and someone saw Lloyd Perkins talking to us and Moriarty figured, okay, we're cleaning house. I'm killing off this guy just so he doesn't talk to Sherlock Holmes. I love that. I So far, two very clever observ guesses by Shay. Reasonable guess. Okay, Jonathan says, now you got me worried about Johnny Apollo, but he's going to stick with Brandon. Less coincidences. Okay. All right. So everyone's got their official vote in. We don't have to have a single vote. Everyone's allowed to have different votes, different answers they guess on. Okay, now we move back up to Ormond. Did Ormond murder Cole? We all think no, right? Because we ran into Meeks at the end and he's trying to chop, chop the cabbage and it's clear that the sword that's made to look like it beheaded Cole could not have beheaded Cole. It wasn't sharp enough. It was some ceremonial sword. So Cole is just found in Ormond's office, made to look like Ormond killed him. But we don't think he really did. Now the question is, what happened to Ormond, the one that's disappeared? I'll give you my theory on Ormond. It's the same one I had before. We know Ormond was one of the Bel in Belfort's pocket, which means Moriarty had reason to dislike him. We also learned at the Cheshire Cheese and somewhere else too, I think, that Ormond was in a very angry argument with Shank from Shank's Brewery. So, and we know that Ormond and Henry Cole were both trying to tax the breweries and make alcohol illegal, things that Moriarty wouldn't want. So the case I made was that Moriarty sees a chance, a very clever chance to kill both of these MPs, and he gets a bunch of benefits from that. First, he gets rid of Cole and Ormond, who are voting against the brewery. That's great. 
He makes an example of them, of Cole, so that anyone who might defy him later would think twice. He shows he's got, he can reach and kill MPs. But the clever part is he's going to kill one of them in a violent way, which is going to create all this press and delay the beer act and make the MP scared. But he's also going to make it look like Reginald Ormond did it and is on the run. So as far as the police think, they've just, they have, they're not looking for another criminal. The police think it's Ormond killed him and is on the run and they keep hunting for it, keeps the story in the news. Whereas all the people in the know know that Moriarty was able to get and kill two MPs. And we see a little cab going from the Cheshire Cheese to Moriarty's house. So my best guess is that Moriarty's man plants the body at Ormond's office and kidnaps Ormond and puts him in a shallow grave out near Shanks Brewery or in Queens Park. So I think Ormond is dead, kidnapped by Moriarty. That's my, that's my guess. I'm going to see dead, kidnapped by Moriarty. Now, the other good option would be that he's on the run. But the question would be, why would he go on the run? Let's say he comes into his office. He sees Cole dead and beheaded. He says, oh my God, I'm, they're trying to frame me and make it look like I killed him. But you can't go on the run as an MP. He's got a famous family. He's got a whole family living in London. He's well known. His best bet would be going right to the police and saying, I didn't do it. Someone's trying to frame me. Going on the run would be the worst idea. That's why I think he didn't go on the run and he must have been kidnapped. And therefore, and since he worked for Belfort, we know his alliances. I suppose the other possibility is that the Belfort group is hiding him. That's a reasonable possibility, right? What if he sees Cole dead and he says, they're going to try to kill me. Moriarty's going to kill me. And he runs to Belfort and says, hide me until this blows over. It's a possibility. Let's see what the chat votes are. Anna says, Ormond kidnapped after the Cheshire Cheese meeting and now is probably dead. Okay, so Anna and I are on the same boat. Jonathan, what do you say? Let's see what Shay says. No one else wants to venture, and no one else who hasn't played wants to venture any guesses. Let's see what Shay says. Shay says is he caught a cab to Moriarty place, to Moriarty's place, and he's most likely dead. Okay, so sounds like Shay agrees, although Shay thinks maybe he voluntarily took the cab to Moriarty. Maybe he thought he could reason with him. <laughs> Jonathan, what say you? Jonathan says, for drama, I'm going to go with the Balfour group is hiding him. Okay, I like it. All right, and now, finally, we get to our most difficult and most important and central question of the case. What happened? Who is responsible for Franklin Kearney's disappearance and why? Now, I do want to point out something. Anna says he'd go to his solicitors, not Balfour if he's on the run. Jonathan pointed out something very cool. We were thinking, did Sherlock Holmes rescue him, etc.? Or was he? No, the question was, was he hiding out with Sherlock Holmes this whole time to teach us a lesson? That was one theory. One theory is this was all a made up lark with Kearney disappearing to quiz us, to teach us. That's what I, th I considered that because he's Holmes starts this whole case saying, are you guys ready? Are my irregulars ready to take on a big case? So he thought, OK, maybe he set this whole thing up. But Jonathan pointed out two interesting things on the last day. First of all, when Kenny comes in, he looks around and then he says to Watson, Mr. Holmes. And then he says, and Watson says, no, I'm Dr. Watson. Holmes is not here yet. So Jonathan was pointing out, okay, obviously he doesn't know. He doesn't recognize who Holmes is. He's never seen him in person. So there goes the idea that this was all a setup by Holmes to test us. Then the other thing that was noticed here is 
how Kearney has given us a little smirk. Holmes comes in right behind him soon after, and he, Kearney seems mildly amused by the pandemonium his entrance has caused. That is really troubling. That is really troubling. That really sounds like he has not been held by anyone, and all his letters were telling the truth about how he was just all away on business. It is very hard to reconcile being amused by this pandemonium with the, with the idea that he's just escaped. All right. Now... The other really troublesome part about that whole story is that the very last clue that we read, when we were reading the book, we discovered a key clue, it appeared. Let's take a look at it. It was Luella Carnes. We know he had a Perkins had a framed photo of a woman. This woman claims to be his half-brother. Not only does that, and she's upset by his death, and we're not 100% sure this is a genuine clue, but I believe it is. She tells a story. She tells a story about how Perkins loves to play these elaborate pranks, and he roped her in to play a prank, so he says. He assures me no one's going to get hurt. He tells her to go to Kearney's house so no, he doesn't just tell her. He picks her up in a cab. They drove for quite a while. Then they went into the house where Roy, uh, Roy told her, which is where Franklin Kearney lives. She describes a scene that seems consistent with where Kearney lives. He's up on the second floor. She knocks on his door. This is Sunday night when he disappears suddenly. So we think this is... Mm, okay. I got a message saying that I lost connection. Can the chat tell me if I'm reconnected now? Let me actually bring up something so I can see it. Uh, did anyone know, did I lose connection and for how long is my question? Yes, you're still here. All right, so I didn't lose connection. I was just false alarm. Okay. Yeah, I'm live now, but did anything get lost? Or was I still walking through this lead here? Nothing got lost? Okay. So she tells Franklin Kearney, according to her, that your fiancé, Alice, needs to see you right away. Oh, John says, I did lose connection for 30 seconds. Okay. Well, anyway, I'm just reading the lead from Luella saying how Lloyd Perkins set her up on this prank... They drove for some time, they picked her up at her house, drove for some time to Kearney's house, told Kearney, your fiancé needs to see you right away, come down. They get in a cab together, and Perkins says, don't worry, not only is Kearney not going to get hurt, but he's going to be glad that, this, that we're doing this. They go back into the cab, they traveled again for quite some time, so quite some time, they pick her up, quite some time to Kearney's house, quite some time more. Then Kearney gets out to talk to someone, presumably, somewhere, and then they drive a short period of time back to her house and drop her off. We say, do you know where they dropped him off or to who? And she says, no, it was dark, but it was near railroad track. Okay. Now, if I look at, I was saying, I was looking at the map here. Well, here's where Luella lives, 96. And Kearney lives here at 83. So I was thinking they take her on a long drive from her house to Kearney's house. Then they drive a long way again drop off Kearney, and then in a short period of time, she's dropped off. So to me, that sounds like these are the railroad tracks that she saw. The Liverpool Station tracks. 
Now, there is one place along those tracks that is very significant to us. That's Shanks Brewery, where the brewery people are. We know they're up to no good. They know they're tied in with me, Moriarty. So I'm thinking now that Perkins has arranged to kidnap, to take Kearney, and possibly has taken him to Shanks Brewery, where we were thinking Holmes might be disguising himself as a workman to set Kearney free if he's being held. But then that still leaves the question of who broke into his house to get his toiletries? We thought that was him breaking in, but obviously not if he's being held. If he's being held, for what purpose? And if he's being held and was set free, why is he so bemused and not upset about being held? My best theory is we know they've planted stories with one of the other writers, so I'm trying to work out in my mind this theory where Perkins captures him or says, when he gets in the cab, he says, I'm sorry for this runaround. It's not about your wife. I've got information for you on Belfour. I'm going to feed you everything you need to know to uncover the Belfour mystery. Come with me. And they go, and maybe they get to Shanks Brewery, and he says, I'm going to keep you here for three days while I tell you all about this, and then we'll, set you, we'll let you free in three days. That's one possibility. And then he writes the letter to his wife and to Holmes and says, don't worry about me, I'm, I'll be fine. That's one possibility. And maybe they were thinking, okay, if we disappear this guy... Maybe they'll also be investigating and they'll stumble onto Belfour. Like we've seen Perkins saying, hey, they could be connected, your missing guy and Belfour. So maybe they were hoping to also that his disappearance would trigger more investigations into Belfour. That's my sort of best guess. Now, I do have an alternative theory, though, which is similar. And that is that it starts out basically the same. Perkins takes him in the cab, drops him off for a secret meeting. Maybe he meets Moriarty and he realizes, whoa, I am in way over my head. They say, we hear you've been sniffing around. If you sniff into us, into Moriarty's side of this, we're going to have you killed and your fiancé killed and everyone killed. But you can write about Belfour. And we've got some hints that he used to write for the police and then he was hard into drinking and was a drunk. And then he got saved by his fiance and moved to sports. So my other alternative theory is sort of they have this meeting with him where they feed him this information and he, he learns he's in way over his head. And he, they either give him drink at the brewery and he starts drinking with them or he escapes and starts drinking, and he basically goes on a three-day bender and is too embarrassed to come home. So he sneaks back into his place, gets his toiletries, and then he's in hiding until he can shake off his drunk and then come home. That's my sort of alternate theory. They still both tie in with Perkins giving, feeding him information, but in one he escapes. Although, I don't know, in, and then that just puts Holmes perhaps still in the Shanks Brewery spying on them. One nice idea about him being kidnapped is that Holmes runs, comes in the door right after him, still dressed as a horse workman. So that leads to the theory that maybe Holmes freed him, but he didn't even know that Holmes freed him. And then Holmes is just sort of following him back to... To his house, I guess another possibility is that Holmes was spying on Kearney wherever Kearney was. Maybe Kearney was sleeping it off in some horse stable and Holmes was just hanging out there. So I'm going to go with being kidnapped and held and maybe they, they broke into his house to get his toiletries for him. That they were sort of holding him not as a victim, but as like, you stay with us, we'll protect you, and we'll feed you information. I'm not 100% thrilled. But maybe he considered himself to be away on business. Let's see what the chat says. I don't love any of those. 
Anna says, my problem is how on earth would you find Luella? She's in the directory, but we don't know her last name. You just read through the entire directory for Luella. That's a great, that's a very good point. Um, we know that she tells us her maiden name, and we went through the clues looking for a mention of Carr in her middle name. So one possibility is it's a bug that they forgot to put her under the right name. Another possibility is that somewhere in this clue book, we hear a whiff of his maiden name. Another possibility is that you're meant to just find the only Luella in the directory. Don't know. Jonathan Warner says, my final guess, Moriarty tricked Kearney into being detained, but believing it's of his own volition. Maybe claims they're protecting him from Balfour. Pretty much Jesse's first guess. Anna says, I get, I agree as a final guess. I don't like it, though. They kill MPs, no problem. Torture people, but Kearney is fine after a week. Yeah. I guess the difference is I don't think he knows he's been kidnapped. Yeah, it has to be maybe that he doesn't know. Something's going on where he doesn't know he's been kidnapped. And then what is our explanation for the toiletries? They went and got them for him? And then they had him write these letters, or he wanted to write the letters. It's also, I'll give you another possibility, that they put him on a train. What if Perkins gives him a clue and says, hey, a day's ride away, here's where you'll discover evidence of Belfour, just to get rid of him. We know Perkins is a practical joker, but then who went and got his things? Maybe they did that just to make it look like he was still alive. But maybe he really was on a train gallivanting outside of London looking for evidence. John says they might have stolen his torches just to throw more suspicion on his disappearance to get more eyes pointing at him. Or maybe even you could imagine Belfour broke in to see if there was any evidence. And it says, but Holmes was at Shanks. He was searching for Kearney, so he must have been there the whole time. Yeah, that's reasonable. We don't know that Holmes was at Shanks, but that's our best guess. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if we weren't wrong on some detail of Kearney. Okay, but we're going to say... He was brought, I'm going to say he was brought to Shanks and then kept there as if to gain info voluntarily, let's just say. But why wouldn't he insist on talking to his wife? And then why? Why? Who is responsible and why? Why would they do that? I'm going to say they want to convince him to write bad stories about Balfour. I don't love it, but I just don't know. I almost think it makes more sense that he's on a drunk. It is weird that Holmes and him arrive at the same time, though. I'm going to put a little bit like here. Or drunk. I'm going to change my official answer. I'm going to change my official answer that he got drunk, that he was on a drunk. I still say they took him to Shanks, they showed him all this information, and then he was on a drunk. 
Oh, but that's not the why, though. That's still the why. Okay, to convince him. I guess it's not asking me where he went. Well, I'm gonna get. I'm gonna guess that part of this answer to that is that he was drunk and moving around. I don't know though. Okay, the chat says, Jonathan says, I think the why is Moriarty wants to create a mysterious disappearance of someone looking into Balfour's to attract police or homes. Um, Jonathan, I thought that first too. I thought, oh, they'll kidnap him and that'll make the investigators investigate. But then on day two, he sends all the letters that say, I'm fine. So why would you have him do that? Why would you have him write letters saying everything's fine if you want the investigation to push forward? If you're going to keep him hidden against his will and you want investigation, you wouldn't write those letters from him saying they're fine. And we know those are real letters from him because he writes nicely. Yeah, I'm going to change my answer. Who's responsible? Why would they want to get rid of him? I think they put him on a train out of town. And he really was out of town. Oh, I don't know. Train out of town, but then why break in and get his toiletries? I don't know. I really don't know. Jonathan says, and his final answer is Moriarty to convince him to work for him. I still don't like it. Jonathan says, the only reason I don't like the train is who told him anyone was looking for him. Why wouldn't he write more explanation in a letter? I think that's a very good point. I think that's a very good point. Why wouldn't he write in a letter? Something. What does he write? Does he say he's on business? I understand you have been looking for me. I'm writing to inform you that I'm all right and unharmed. I have had to go out of town for a few days on business. Shall return in a day or two. I appreciate your concern. Your help is unnecessary. I will explain when I return. Uh, let me throw another wrench in this theory that he's captured at the Shanks thing. Like, he's now going to tell Sherlock Holmes and the police, I've been kidnapped, I've been held at Shanks Brewery. That's terrible. They can't afford that. The Shanks Brewery people in Moriarty can't have that. Is there any scenario where they're hiding him for his... They need him out of town. They need him disappeared for three days. Why would that be? He's investigating Balfour. He's getting very close to Balfour. Is it possible that someone just needs him gone for a few days and then, then it's okay? Jonathan says, I don't think he knows he's been kidnapped. 
Yeah, I agree. He doesn't seem to know he's been kidnapped. Maybe he doesn't know where he is. But why? Okay, so let's, let's think of it that way. You kidnap him, you hide him in some house blindfolded, you get him his toiletries, you say, we're going to hold you here for three days, then we'll let you go, don't worry. Write this letter, say you'll be back, everything's fine, we're going to let you go, you won't know where you are. Now, why? If you're Moriarty, why? Maybe because you're feeding him the information? And it's saying either the explanation will be very clever or very, very disappointing. Either you're Moriarty feeding him information, but you don't he doesn't know where he is. Okay, so that's that's how we get it. That's how we that's how we make it okay for him to be let free. He doesn't know where he is. They took him in by cab in the dark and they're dropping him, they're gonna return him home. And they're feeding him information. I guess that's still our best bet. But would Belfour have a better reason to kidnap him? But the thing is, where would that be? Belfour doesn't have... Okay, I think I'm going to stick with that. I'm going to stick with... Um, I'm going to differ from Jonathan a little bit. I'm going to say that he must know he's being held, but he thinks he's being held in some way where he's being given information, treated well. They got him his, his stuff from his house. They're like, we just got to keep you here for three days till we finish up this thing we're doing. Then we're going to let you go. It's not a big deal. Here's information about Balfour. All right. Let's take a break. We'll come back. We'll read the solution. So I'll see you in eight minutes when we will read the solution and the long epilogue. You still got your last chance to get in your, your final thoughts. Could he be? Yeah, I don't know. He could also be hiding with his wife and she could be lying to protect him. And he's just in hiding from people who are trying to get him, which is the Belfort group might want to be getting him. We could beat this horse to death. We're taking a break for eight minutes. We'll read the solution. We'll see what the real answer is.
Okay, we're back. You're watching Co-op for Two. We're about to read the solution here. We're all having our final last minute doubts about this Kearney theory. I was thinking, does Kearney have, was discovering the Balfour, looking into Balfour, and Balfour's people kept mentioning that they want to find him because he's sort of their friend a little bit. And I was thinking maybe Lloyd Picker is hiding Kearney and says, you have to hide away. I'm going to help you hide out from the Balfour group for a few days till this whole thing gets wrapped up and blows over. And in the chat, alt last alternate theories is second guess he's been tricked to go out of town. I understand who tells him anyone's worried about him or to send notes. John says tricked into hiding at a hotel. I like this idea. Although, what about this whole coup about how he's dropped off by the railway? And it says, Jameson did say in a week he wouldn't be the only journalist writing about Balfour. So did he know about Moriarty trying to convince Kearney? All right. Well, we've got our basic answers. Let me just see what Shay said about Kearney. Shay says, no one is responsible for his disappearance. He wanted to get proof as to what was going on with Belfort. The crime report is something that never left him, and he wanted to get the proof that was needed. So I guess Shay is guessing that Kearney's just roaming around independently, trying to dig up more evidence. Doesn't seem that convincing why he wouldn't write better notes. John says, 10 EC is not that far from the railroad. Of course, it could also be this railroad here, too. 10 EC. Jonathan thinks they put him up at the Metropolitan Hotel. That's not a terrible idea. And you think, let me just get Jonathan's official answer about who put him up. 
is that Jonathan, do you think Moriarty has put him up or is it Lloyd Picker all on his own has put him up there? Moriarty. Okay. Time for the solution. 40 something hours in. We are going to get our solution. It's okay if it's a little bit of a, it's the journey. Remember the enjoyment of trying to chew through this evidence. If the solution lets us down a little, that's okay. Gaslight certainly did. All right, here we go. Now, I'll remind you that my version didn't have the solution enclosed. You would just fill out the questions, submit them, and maybe you would win $10,000 in rewards. I would love to hear the story, if anyone ever can find real evidence about who won these cases, the Queen's Park Affair and Adventures by Gaslight. Here's the deadline, April 15th, 1985, for this one. Never seen anything about it. There's very little uh, history about this company and the people that made this game, Gary Grady and Suzanne Goldberg, and that's a real shame. Okay, there was your entry form. Okay, solution. Now, we've got two forms of solution. I believe, if my memory is correct, I bought this game used off eBay. I believe my memory is that the person who owned this game actually played it, didn't come with solutions, and typed up in a typewriter the solutions, which they found somewhere. So I believe this is a hand-typed solution list, which is going to be equivalent to this official solution, I think. But it seems to me we should open this first, since this is quite unique. No one else will have this on the planet. And I don't know who the pert man is or woman who played this game who typed this up. Could be full of errors for all I know. It does feel like that thin typewriter paper. This is another piece of traveling in time. We're now traveling in time to the person who played this momentous case and got the solution. So here we go. We've got our questions. We're going to put this aside. This is going to have the solutions here too. All right. Solutions for our questions. It's unfortunate that starting with number one, that's the one we're least confident about. Okay, here we go. A nice faded paper. Okay, who's responsible for Kearney's disappearance? Professor James Moriarty to enlist or coerce his assistance in exposing and ruining Jabez Balfour. Well, I should do these like this, huh? We got it right, basically. No more details than that. Shall we check them? Check the answers simultaneously? Okay, let's check the official answers to make sure it's all the same. Okay, so the official answer says this exactly the same thing. To enlist or coerce his assistance in exposing and ruining Jabez Balfour. So we're going to hear about this in detail in the epilogue. All right, so this was basically our main theory of most of us. Okay, next question. Did Ormond murder Cole? Answer, no. Answer, no. Okay. What happened to Ormond? Answer, he was murdered and decapitated by Johnny the Jackal. That's the guy who works for Moriarty. Okay, we got that right. Three, who stole the Balfour jewels? Balfour himself. Now you can see this was absolutely hand typed in a typewriter by the owner of this case prior to us. Who stole the Balfour jewels? Balfour himself. What happened to them? They were stolen by the Mills brothers during an attempt to fence them at Lambert's. They were later recovered by Colin Kennedy for Balfour. Okay, well, we got that exactly right. Four, who killed Joslyn? We said Don Mills. The answer is Donald Mills. 
Who killed Leland Johnson? We said Colin Kennedy. Answer, Colin Kennedy. Why? We said to get info and to punish him for stealing the jewels. Tortured for whereabouts of jewels, Johnson had arranged the theft. That's right. Who killed Leo Mills? We said again, Colin Kennedy. Answer, Colin Kennedy. Oh, I see. Ormond was the captain. We thought it was coal. Meek said it was coal. Papers also. His son identified him. I think this might... We, we Okay, you're right. This is... We thought he was captured by Moriarty. We It may turn out... Remember, we, sat, we found the... Um, we thought he was killed. We thought Ormond was kidnapped and killed by Moriarty. This could still be consistent with it. We're going to... That's right. So remember, we found that hat box with a bloody head. It may turn out that in the chat, Anna was saying, wait, we thought it was Ormond that was decapitated. We thought it was Cole. It might be both. Sorry, I went through that so quickly. It might very well be that both of them were decapitated, and we're going to hear about that. Or it's possible that there was some switcheroo of bodies, but I don't see how. So I think this might just be telling us that they were both decapitated. And this one never made the papers. Let's pencil that till we read the epilogue. Okay, six. Who killed Leo Mills? Also Colin Kennedy. Why? Tortured for the whereabouts of the jewels which he and his brother stole. So far, all good. Lloyd Perkin was in the employee of what two people? We said Moriarty and Belfour. Professor James Moriarty and Jabez Balfour. Who killed Lloyd Perkins? Okay, here we go. This is a scary one. This could be our... This is the last one that we could conceivably really be wrong on. We said Sir Miller Brandon. The answer is... Sir Miller Brandon. Dum bum bum. Or Miller Brandon. We got it right. Who sent Holmes the Vincent Derrick letter? We said Rose Derrick. Who killed Peter Northrop? We said Johnny the Jackal. Answer, Johnny the Jackal. Who gave the order to kill Peter Northrop? Professor Moriarty. Okay, here we go. We could be wrong about this one too. Where are the counterfeit five-pound plates hidden? Ready? In the mace of the House of Commons. You were right. I mean, you convinced me of it, but... Okay. Who planned the bombing at the cricket match? We said Moriarty. And then lastly, why? To provide a diversion for Northrop's escape and as a warning to Balfour's associates. This is Jonathan added this little point that he thought it was a warning to Balfour also. I wasn't sure about that one, but uh, wow. So that is some good teamwork. That is some very good teamwork. Everyone played a part in helping solve all these things. And... We got every single one right, except we said that Ormond was killed by Moriarty. And here this says he was murdered and decapitated by Johnny the Jackal. So we got this right. We would have said it was Johnny the Jackal who did the, the dirty deed. But we didn't know how we would conclude that he was decapitated. We saw the little um, head. We saw the... A hat box with blood in it. We thought a decapitated head might be in there, but we thought maybe it was um, it was Henry Cole's. Although I did point out at the time, why on earth would you need to put Henry Cole's head in a hat box if you were just bringing his whole decapitated body with you? So this might just be something that you wouldn't be expected to know unless you guessed at it. Maybe the epilogue will tell us, or the epilogue's going to tell us that the decapitated body was actually Ormond's instead of Cole's. Let's look at the official answers, make sure we didn't 
nothing else was translated wrong. Looks like these are the exact official answer that our player filled out. I might actually write to this person that I bought this from, from eBay, and point him to this stream. Okay, so there we go. We got every single question right. Pretty cool. And it's cool how scary we were, except for the death of Ormond. We didn't know the details. Well, Anna says, all for one, we had some evidence, but not Ormond. Well, let's, let's read. We did have the little bit of evidence that, about the hat box, but let us now read the long solution. Now, I don't know... Notice that the person that I bought this from just had that solution. I don't know when this longer solution came out. I don't know if this was even available to people at the time they posted the solutions, but it must have been posted at some point. Okay, so here's the official. All right, now we are going to get our epilogue. <clears throat> All right, everyone settle in. If you're listening to this on audiobook, you can close your eyes, turn out the lights. Cast yourself back in time to this final scene. I think for flavor, we should start by reading this entire scene. Day five. A pensive Watson is pacing back and forth before the fireplace in the familiar sitting room of 221B Baker Street. In his hand, he holds a rolled-up newspaper, which he taps against his leg in time to his marching. Good morning, Dr. Watson. Oh, good morning, good morning, says Watson curtly. Is Holmes about? No, I haven't seen him since yesterday. Have you read this morning's paper, Wiggins? No, sir, not yet. There was another murder in Whitechapel. Annie Chapman, aged 47, was bru found brutally murdered. If I know Holmes, he's probably in Whitechapel beginning his investigation as we speak. Would you care to join me for a cup of coffee? We have no sooner settled around the familiar table with steaming cups of coffee than we hear footfalls upon the stairs. Ah, perhaps that is Holmes now. In a moment, Watson's statement is proved incorrect as we hear a knock at the door. Come in, sighs Watson. A man in his mid-thirties enters the room and quickly surveys our group around the table. He addresses Watson. Mr. Holmes? No, I am Dr. Watson. Mr. Holmes is not in at present. Ah, doctor, I'm pleased to make your acquaintance. I am Franklin Kearney. Wiggins jumps to his feet. Watson's coffee cup drops into its saucer with a loud clank. I understand that Mr. Holmes has been looking for me. I should say, exclaims Watson. Where have you been? asks Wiggins. Kearney seems mildly amused by the pandemonium his entrance has caused. Before our questions can be answered, however, Holmes glides through the open doorway and into the room. He's still dressed in the rough and dirty clothes of a laborer. The potent odor of our equine servants is strongly apparent. Holmes' entrance does nothing to diminish the pandemonium. He removes his dusty cap and places it on the hat rack while he waits for the excitement to subside. Ah, Mr. Kearney, I presume, says Holmes to the visitor. Yes, he replies. How in the world, how in the world did you know that, Holmes? exclaims an astonished Watson. In a moment, Watson. To Kearney, he says, I am sure you have a very interesting story to tell. Please make yourself comfortable while I wash up. Then we can all hear your story. Holmes disappears into his room. Watson pours Franklin Kearney a cup of coffee, and we all sit back in eager anticipation. Here we go. Anna is saying may, uh, maybe the personal items were Ormond's, not 
holes. Okay, here we go. The Queen's Park Affair. Okay, I can see I'm not going to be able to read this from the screen. I'll have to just read it looking down. A refreshed Holmes enters the sitting room. The rough and dirty laborer's clothes replaced now by a mouse-colored dressing gown. We all look at him expectantly, but he says nary a word as he meticulously fills his cherry wood pipe from the Persian slipper and lights it. We can barely contain ourselves when Holmes finally speaks. How does it feel, Mr. Kearney, to have been a pawn in a chess match between London's two great forces of evil? To be quite fair and frank, Mr. Holmes, the experience has been very confusing. My head is still spinning. Yes, I trust the professor has filled your head with more information then even an excellent journalist such as yourself can well digest. The professor? I never knew the name of the gentleman. He was extremely tall and thin. His forehead donned out in a white curve, and his eyes were deeply sunken in his head. He was clean-shaven, pale and aesthetic-looking. His shoulders were rounded, and his face protruded forward, and was forever slowly oscillating from side to side in a curious reptilian fashion. He was treated with great deference by those around him. Deference born of fear, no doubt. He is ex-professor James Moriarty, the Napoleon of crime, and in this great battle for control of London's underworld, he possessed an important advantage over Marion Jabez Balfour. While Balfour had a reputation with law-abiding society to protect as well as his reputation with the underworld society, Moriarty was not so encumbered. Nothing but evil is expected of him. He realized that Balfour's respectability was his Achilles heel and he needed a respectable mouthpiece to tell the world the truth about the man. Who better than a member of Balfour's own temperance society? You should feel honored, Mr. Kearney. Moriarty singled you out, not only because of your membership in the temperance society, but because of your skill as a reporter and your unquestionable integrity. When I first received the letter from Mr. Ledgard, I was already aware that evil forces were lining up to do battle. I knew that I must direct my energies in that direction, and thus I turned over the case of your disappearance to Wiggins and his friends. It was not until later that I realized that they were, in fact, one and the same case. As I quickly recognized that you were in no real danger... There seemed no reason to interfere with the little play that was unfolding. Watson has been listening patiently, as have we all. But he can contain himself, his curiosity, no longer. I say, Holmes, how did you know that there was no danger to Mr. Kearney? And why... Why the deuce did you not let us in on it? Let us, let us and his friends know. I will ignore your second question, Watson, but the answer to the first was available to you all even before we received Mr. Kearney's letter. If you had but applied the logic of which I so often speak. Someone broke into his rooms and removed his clothes and toilet articles. The intruder was not Mr. Kearney himself, or else he would not have entered through the window. Yet the articles removed were not of significant value except as they contributed to Mr. Kearney's comfort. Moriarty had no reason to inconvenience his guest any more than necessary. He sent someone to recover those items which might make Mr. Kearney stay with him as agreeable as possible. And now perhaps you will let us know 
How you have spent the last week, Mr. Kearney? Well, last Sunday evening, I can hardly believe it's been but one week. A young lady came to my door and told me that my dear Alice needed me at once. Perhaps it was foolish of me, but I asked no questions and went with her. We traveled some distance through the city while the woman promised ignorance, professed ignorance, as to both our destination and the reason for Alice's summons. At last the brougham stopped and I was led into a cellar smelling of hops and malt. As you said, Mr. Holmes, I was treated quite well and efforts were made to make me comfortable, but it was an unsettling experience nonetheless. It was not until the following morning that I met the man you call the professor. He asked me many questions, more to stimulate my own thoughts than to hear my answers, I later realized. Kearney pauses to sip some hot tea, sip, to sip some of the hot tea which Mrs. Hudson has just brought. Holmes sits in the wicker basket chair and takes up the tale. Yes, it was clear from the contents of your desk that you had already begun to be suspicious of Balfour and his dealings. The clippings from the Pall Mall Gazette indicated this interest, and the unfinished draft of your article covering the Wormwood Scrubs cricket match breaks off at a very interesting point suggesting that a mental discovery had been made, much as a physical discovery can be deduced from an unfinished search of a room. Nice. Yet it is ironic that I, a former slave to the demon alcohol, was so slow to recognize that several of the Marleybone gentlemen were quite intoxicated. It was also clear that this fact was not unknown to Balfour and thus confirmed my growing suspicions that his involvement in the temperance movement was but a charade. I have had a great deal of time and assistance to put together the many pieces of this puzzle, though many questions remain. The bomb apparently served a dual purpose. It was a warning to the gentleman involved with Balfour and also a diversion to facilitate the escape of a convict by the name of Northrop. I know not what part he played in this drama. Maybe that's, uh... Maybe this is Kearney talking. And Holmes is chiming in now. He was a master engraver involved in a counterfeiting scheme of Moriarty's. He did not realize the deadliness of his employer and foolishly tried to extract a higher-than-offered price for the revelation of the location of the counterfeit plates. The ruthless Johnny the Jackal made him pay dearly for his greed. I think I know where the plates are, Mr. Holmes, offers Wiggins. Do you now? And where, pray tell? In the mace of the House of Commons, we say. I believe you are right, Wiggins, and Lestrade will undoubtedly be glad to find them, although he will be less glad to thank us, I dare say. Moriarty kept the jackal quite busy this week, and from a detached viewpoint, one must admire the jackal's cunning as well as his dexterity. Ormond's murder was brilliantly executed by him, as it was deviously planned by Moriarty. Okay, so we did get this part wrong. Let's hear now. Ormond's murder, queries Watson. I thought it was Cole who was murdered by Ormond. Cole was murdered as well, of course. That is the beauty of it, states Holmes. Moriarty was able to eliminate both the parliamentary obstacles to his brewery and public house profits. So he did kill both of them. Holmes continues as his revelation is met by puzzled stares. Follow the reasoning. Ormond had no current motive to kill Cole, if he found none in the passionate events 20 years ago. And so, why such a grisly end? The answer can be found at Tetley and Butler. Only the head of Mr. Cole, carefully exchanged for that of Mr. Ormond by the new 
T-Woman, Johnny, was identified. The body was clothed by, clothed by Mr. Ormond's tailor. Therefore, it is actually Mr. Ormond's body. Thus, Moriarty disposes of two opponents by explaining the disappearance of one with the murder of the other. You will now understand the blood in the hat box, Wiggins. And for Mr. Kearney, you may now appreciate your great fortune in merely being abducted by Moriarty, who has had a hand in these murders as well as that of young Lord Goodwin. Okay, this makes no sense. <laughs> we can talk about it later. This replacing of the body and the head makes no sense. We'll talk about that later. But he did kill both of them. So we essentially, we actually did get that question right. Okay. But Anna is right that we missed that important clue about his body. But we'll talk about that in a second. Lord Goodwin? Yes, only Moriarty's organization had the resources to procure explosives from a French armory. Goodwin was useful to Balfour for his land, which Goodwin was willing to let him develop. Balfour is a despicable character, to be sure, not only on a local level. But why does Moriarty care about... Oh, this is Watson. Why does Moriarty care about Balfour's activities? asked Watson. Elementary! Competition and revenge. No businessman, not even a criminal one, welcomes competition for resources, market, or opportunity. Moriarty wants to cede no possible area of endeavor to another. Moreover, he has a score to settle with Balfour, who drove him from the boxing arena, as it were, in Southwark. Thus, Moriarty has been for some time manipulating the stock market, seriously damaging Belfort's financial situation. We know from your own investigations, Mr. Kearney, as well as those of Jameson, Wiggins, and the unfortunate Mr. Perkins, the effect that Moriarty's plotting had on Belfort's empire. Moriarty hired the safecracker Willard Jaffe to retrieve Belfort's private business papers from his safe but Jaffe was unable to open it with explosives before the butler and, close on his heels, Belfort himself returned home. Learning of the situation, he sent the servants in search of the burglar and went to check on the wife's contents, safe's contents, which were untouched. He realized what an opportunity his rival had afforded him at a time when he was desperately in need of money with which to cover notes due for redemption, and he took his wife's jewels, hoping to both fence them and claim the insurance money. But if Moriarty was disappointed, so was Belfour, at least temporarily. Leland Johnson, with whom Belfour's minion, Colin Kennedy, had arranged the fence, engaged the Mills brothers to disrupt it and steal the jewels. Kennedy forced this information from Johnson, then killed him for his betrayal. He then extracted the whereabouts of the jewels from Leo Mills and recovered them from Donald Mills, whom he tracked to the flat of Edna Whelan. But now... But how do you know it was Kennedy that killed these three? Asks Wiggins. Well, Kennedy must surely not have endeared himself to Balfour at Romano's when he brought him the news of the jewel's loss. So he was certainly motivated. The carriage logs make it easy to follow his path. And as you yourself noted at Miss Wheedland's Wiggins, Donald Mills recognized the enormous former pugilist. Presumably his employer rewarded him well after he recovered the jewels, and he returned to his homeland. Watson volunteers. So Belfort killed Perkins for informing to Moriarty? 
Well, indirectly, Watson. The actual instrument was Sir Miller Brandon, who was to meet Perkins at 7.11 in the morning of his death. Clearly, his cryptological skills were less acute than yours, or he would never have left the ciphered note to Moriarty, recommending further sales to depress the brewery stock in Perkins' study. Then, Belfour also had Vincent Derrick killed in July? asked Wiggins. Quite possibly, Watson expost expostulates. So, Derrick actually did write the note? Oh, you do so disappoint, Watson. You yourself hold the evidence disputing this preposterous, if whimsical, notion. Do you not notice that every word in the supposedly posthumous note from poor Mr. Derrick was available for tracing in the autograph given you by Rose Derrick, and that the address on the typewritten envelope was not? Well, Mr. Kearney, I presume you have quite a bit of writing to do. I hope that I have helped to show you how your rather minor role fits into the totality of the Queen's Park affair. Perhaps you will oblige me by spending some time with me and providing me with as much detail as you can recall of your dealings with Professor Moriarty. And that is it. So a lot of people on this, oh, this was a real team effort. Anna found a bunch of stuff about the tracings of the letter, how every word could be found exactly traced in Vincent Derrick's original letter. It wraps up and tells us, well, we don't know how Vincent Derrick was killed, but quite probably by Balfour. Everything matches up. The only thing that seems to me silly is the part about the body and the head being switched. So let's talk about that for one little second. Anna says, we did miss some evidence to that effect. We know the son identified the dead person. So that, we know Cole's son identified the dead person. So we knew that it was Cole's head, at least. And then, as Anna points out, there was evidence that we didn't get a chance to see because we didn't go to those places in time. We sort of skimmed them at the end, I guess, that the body might have been Ormond's. But what's ridiculous about that is the solution that Holmes presents is actually the exact solution we had about the motives. We said that Moriarty wanted to kill both of them and sort of make it look like one killed the other for revenge. But then why on earth would you do this body switch? What, what purpose does that serve? You want to kill both of them. Why are you going to this crazy trouble to switch bodies unless you want it to be discovered as sort of a psychopathic thing? But the only thing that would do is make the public think there's a psychopathic killer out there who's, you know, like playing some game switching bodies. So it doesn't make any sense for Balfour to do that. So we did talk about Jonathan suggested it might be a body switch suggested and Tina, and we talked about it briefly. But if you remember when we talked about it, and it's pointing out more evidence that we had about the items on the body, but we talked about a body switch, but here's what I said at that time. I said, that doesn't help us in any way. You can't do a body switch without them both being dead. So no matter how you look at it, they're both dead. That was my conclusion. Like if you find a hand, then you're like, oh, he's dead because we found the hand. Then you could say, oh, well, maybe something was done and it's his hand, but not his body. So he's not really dead. But in our case, we considered it could be a body switch. But the fact that they both have to be dead meant to what aim? What's the there's a um, there's a Latin phrase we've talked about before here. It's come up before and it's whatever it is. It's like who gains? 
to whose benefit does this it's part of part of um part of motive asking motive when you're working on a case to whose benefit does this would this turn that you would replace these bodies and no one benefits so that was a ridiculous explanation i suppose the evidence might have been there that the bodies were swapped uh but i don't see how anyone would benefit from it so it seems weird qui bono that's right well okay so we got our epilogue we got almost everything right we basically had the Kearney theory that was our best basic guess although I was I was leaving myself some outs about him getting drunk but we were basically right about um about Kearney being kidnapped by Morty already helped at the brewery there were a couple of things that the game didn't resolve for us that we had questions like what was Sherlock Holmes doing undercover he didn't really say that he was at Shanks Brewery and what he was doing I guess he was just saying he was going undercover in general. The woman who showed up to Moriarty's place, uh, we didn't really get her backstory, although we didn't think we really needed to. What other, did we have any other questions that we got answers to? Where are our list of unresolved questions here? Let's take a look here. So the Peter Northrop breakout murder was just a coincidence. Um, no significance of Bon Marsh. No significance of the betting slips. No significance about the Bon Marsh sports store, which I really saw lots of cabs going to. So that really threw me. Why was Vincent Derrick killed and by whom? Holmes just suggests he probably was killed by Belfort, but we don't know the details of it. There was no real way to prove who killed Lloyd Perkins. No evidence beyond what we looked at. No solution to Lord Goodwin. I guess he's just trying to throw people off his trail. Why Belfort denies the real estate article. I guess our solution to that now is that it was, it was either... It was either true, but he, it was important for him to deny it, and some mole must have told Jameson about it, or it wasn't true just to harm his reputation. Um, nothing for all of these. Kearney is alive. We got that settled. Who was at Kearney's house rummaging? We now know that wasn't Kearney. It was one of Moriarty's men. The Luella photo, I guess we came up with. We figured that out. We didn't need to find the fake umpire. We didn't need to find these other people. The lady in the sealskin coat going to Moriarty's house is just going to be a character in a future story. And what is Holmes up to? We don't know. He's just investigating stuff. So there we go. Let's check in with the chat and hear some thoughts. AJ Hunter has been wanting to join in our conversation since the beginning because he's played it recently. Um, AJ Hunter says, uh, Anna says, the main explanation for that Moriarty singled out Kearney, but wanted to persuade him by kidnapping him isn't believable, I think. He could have just given him the info anonymously. Yeah, I think that's about right. It would have been better if there was a reason why he wanted him off the scene. AJ Hunter said, they were both high-profile po politicians who would be missed, and Moriarty didn't want the police looking too closely. I mean, swapping the bodies is a good way to get the police to look into it more closely. Uh, if the bodies don't look the same, his son might have realized it. So it would have been better to bury Ormond's body where it was never discovered. Then everyone would think that he killed him. That's, that makes much more sense. Yeah, that, I, that theory of ours was much better. No heads, no ID. But he did give him a head of Henry Cole. That's why swapping the body does not make any, does not help Moriarty. It just, the body you could identify by fingerprints or something else as Cole, as Ormond. So bet, much better for you to make everyone think Ormond's on the run. I think. Or leave him dead on the side of the road somewhere. Swapping the bodies is really gets you nothing and just magnifies your risk by millions. 
All right, any other thoughts? I think uh, fingerprints were in their infancy at this time. Cole's head was in Ormond's office, so I identified both. I don't know what that means, but anyway, Cole Cole Cole's head was ident Cole was identified by his son. You think his son might uh, no, might notice the body looks different? Uh, maybe they look the same. Anyway, there's no point in arguing the Orman thing more. There was evidence for us to figure out that it was Orman's body. But if we had found that it was, if we had figured out that it was Orman's body and Cole's head. I guess it would have convinced us further that Armand was dead, which we were still taking was taking a risk about. But I think we would have really struggled to understand why, and the game had no good answer for that. So it's almost lucky for us that we didn't figure out that it was Ormond's body. Because if we had figured out it was Ormond's body, we would have wanted to figure out what the motive was for swapping the two. So now what? Moriarty's got to bury Cole's body with Ormond's head somewhere where it'll never be found? Why? Or is he going to dump it somewhere where it'll be found? That just doesn't make any sense. Okay, it doesn't matter. Not an important part of this case. All right, so here's what we'll do. We'll take another break here. <laughs> we'll take another break for five minutes, and we'll come back, and we'll try to give some coherent thoughts about this entire experience, this case, how it compares, etc. Five minutes, collect your thoughts, get out your notes about your favorite parts, your least favorite parts, etc. I'll see you in five minutes.
Okay, we're back. You're watching Co-op for Two. Now we're going to discuss, review the case. We'll look at the Space Cowboys version in detail. We'll try to compare, see how they differ, give our thoughts on the experience, subjective, and maybe some game design notes, etc. I've, I've typed up some notes, but I really do want to hear from the chat your thoughts as much as you've got. So we'll hang around here as long as we want till I hear from all of you. And if you're watching this after the fact, please post your comments either on this YouTube video or on the Board Game Geek forum, somewhere on the Queen's Park Affair or on the Guild forum for this channel. I One of the more enjoyable parts of playing these big giant cases is talking to the few people who ever make it through them. And it's sort of a small, special group of people, and it's fun to chat with them. All right, so let's let's catch up on the chat first for a bit. Um, Anna says, final thoughts. Great, dense, but interesting case. Required real group effort, a few hundred notes. I mean, we've got like 30 pages or more of notes here, rivaling the notes that we took for Adventure by Gaslight. And it says, I did like discussing the theories about all the little and big questions, surprisingly few bugs. Jonathan Warner says, my overall impression for availability and price, this is probably the best of these epic sized cases, just as challenging as the rest. But this one is not my personal favorite story wise. And it says, solution wasn't satisfying though, but that's almost the case, so not unexpected. Jonathan says, too large a cast, not a character I was significantly personally invested in. I think there could have been more emphasis on a character we really care about, caught between these two warring criminal factions. Anna says, the Kearney thread was one of the main ones, but for me that was the more problematic. I like discovering Balfour's backstory in the brewery and land shenanigans. Shay says, there's not a chance anyone could solve this game if you played by the official time rules. All right, keep the thoughts coming. Let me just look over my notes here. I'd like to hear what your favorite parts are, your least favorite parts. All of the comments so far seem on the money to me. Let's hear from AJ Hunter, who's played this game before us recently, though. I'm very curious. I think recently. AJ, I'm very curious to hear your thoughts on... First, I'd like to hear how you played it. Did you play it solo? Did you play it... How, over what time period did you play it? How did you bend the rules? You saw we bent the rules quite a bit, and we read everything. 
and it says officially you could go over the days more than once, so no real time limit really if you played by the recommended ways. One of the things I'm going to talk about here, my thoughts, and I'd like to get your thoughts as well when we get to that time, is advice for new people playing the game. And I think we will. Ha I would have some advice to play it differently, not according to the rules. And Tina says, I didn't mind playing without the time penalties for moving, but seeing which leads would change and go there felt a little bit like cheating. The fact that we noted which lead is changing on the next day is harder to justify. Does feel a bit more like cheating, yes. Jonathan says, the cipher was interesting. At first, I did not like that you had to try to guess between 26 or 2, followed by 6. But on reflection, it's clever how by starting... One at Z and going backwards makes one and two not very likely being Z and Y. That's a very nice point. If everyone's following what Jonathan's saying, he's saying the ones and the twos are almost always double digit numbers. Very pretty clever. AJ Hunter said, I played solo beginning on September 1st to September 24th, 2001. Oh, okay. So 22, 21 years ago. AJ played. That's a long time ago. It's hard to believe this was written in 1985. 37 years ago or so. And AJ played so well. Ah, this seems like a absolute terrifying thing. Oh, AJ Center says, no, not 2001, 2021, last year. Okay, so it might be a little fresher. This seems like a terrifying game to play fully solo. It could be done, but boy, do you have to have a... This would be a totally different experience without people to help you bounce ideas off of. And what did you think of it, AJ Hunter? John says, I also like the copied letter from Rose. That was a very clever clue. Shay says, I enjoyed playing this game without using the time rule. I'm glad I played in a group as you needed someone to bounce ideas off of. Yeah, I mean, all of these games benefit, really benefit from having multiple people. They're almost all follow the same pattern of you could play it solo, but it's going to be harder. It's going to be substantially harder if you play any of these games solo. But with these super long ones like this one, it's a whole different additional thing going on in terms of stamina and willingness to sort of stick to the rules and... I think in addition to being harder to play it solo, it's it's much harder to convince yourself to sort of stick to the program and keep detailed notes and do all the work. That's what it is. The difficulties increase when you play them solo, but for games like this, the amount of work that you'd have to put in to do it solo, whether it's working on the ciphers or uh, copying the evidence or comparing it or looking at those, tracing those cab logs, it becomes too much for one person to do. And it's very hard, at least my experience has been, it's very hard for me to keep up the same commitment to work, to doing the work, than it is if you're playing in a group and like an adventure game, it's, it's more tempting when you're doing it alone to sort of peek at the answer and stuff. I don't know if AJ ever feel, feel, felt that way. AJ says, I never did get the first two answers, though I thought Moriarty was behind it. And it says, all of the Sherlock Holmes consulting detective games are better in a group. Alone is not as much fun. Megan says, agree with all the comments thus far. Seems like a lot of the clues and little puzzles within didn't have too much of a payoff in the final results or story. AJ says, didn't get the Brand Miller Brandon killer part or the Rose Derrick part. Jonathan Warner says, I did not enjoy the name vomit at the beginning, and I think it took a bit too long for the important ones to come into focus. Along the same line, so many potential relevant addresses really made the cab logs less enjoyable early on, in my opinion. Well, Jonathan and I are uh, typically on the same, same wavelength about some of this stuff, and we certainly are in this case. So let me talk for a little bit about... Uh, so talk in the chat, but don't talk too much where it will scroll up. Let me talk for a little bit here. Let me talk about the 
the pros, the things that I really liked here. First of all, it was a surprise. It wasn't what I expected. I expected from the Board Game Geek posts about this in relation to Adventures by Gaslight that this one would be easier and more straightforward. In fact, I think I would put this as the hardest, most complicated, confusing, overwhelming case of all of the big Sherlock Holmes consulting detective cases and their and their spin on and the games inspired by them. So in that sense, and it, it was it was wonderful to to have that. This is a very rare thing. We've now played the two cases that fit into this category, and that's it. There's only two in this category, really, that are this kind of experience. This and Adventures by Gaslight. All right, so there were a bunch of things that were really cool here. First of all, there were some great scenes. There was a scene where Wiggins got asked a woman out on a date. There was a scene where women, Wiggins was admiring the model. And Wiggins was really front and center in this case. It is absolutely true that the other characters in this case, the people, the clients, weren't that interesting and we didn't really feel for. But Wiggins feels like he sort of came into his own in this case, and there was a lot of personal interaction with Wiggins in various places. And there were some great scenes, the ones where he asked out people, but the discussions with the safe crackers and the people in jail. We visited two people in jail. We had these big, long two-page entries for some of them. We talked to the Madame, who is the fortune teller, and there was a little wink, wink, nod, nod about whether she really believed it in or not. There were some subtle things about when we met the PI, and he's like, I'm just, I'm gonna call and make a call and check that you are who you say they were. There were some cool uh, sort of history things about England. Learned, we learned some new words and terms, which I always love in these games. We learned about the different woods used for carriages. So those were some of my favorite scenes. And this almost feels like this might have been the start of, well, I guess we've decided that the crime dossier books are the start of the evidence things. But here was a real case of Sherlock Holmes consulting detective merged with evidence. We got this full envelope of evidence on different paper stock of different types, business cards, betting slips of written letter, a typed envelope. Very cool to have that. Now, it turned out that that was almost, almost all of that evidence was irrelevant for us. If you look at it, right? The betting slips had nothing to do with anything. Pinkerton card, nothing to do with anything. Daniel Oliver led us a little bit to something. Liberator Society led us to Jabez, but we didn't really need this. Bon Marsh was total red herring. These two articles weren't very useful for us. Um, this was useless to us. The shipping thing that he won for his wife was just another red herring. This one was full of names of people involved, and Jonathan had a complaint about it, and I would as well. I'll get to that in a second. But these were very cool. This article basically had nothing important in it. I mean, it told us a little bit of story, but we did not need to have it as evidence. So it was fun to have these but they didn't really serve much of a purpose. They were just little gimmicky pieces of evidence. They could have just as well been in the book. However, the book in general made use of such varied evidence that was really fun, and especially the breaking it up into days and how we got different evidence at each day. Like on the first day, we get this evidence that's in the envelope. Then in the second day, we get a letter and the contents of a letter and another letter. You could have given us this us in evidence too. That might have been fun, sort of like, okay, now open envelope two. That would have been even more enjoyable. But this was cool. Then we got another letter on day three. And then throughout the book, we got letters. We got the, in that one case of the dead man, we got his etching from his scratching on the scale, uh, on the calendar to get the 
contents of the day underneath. And then we got this full cipher. And I forget what day this came out, but this was at, at some point I was like, okay, now the case is calming down and then bang, all of a sudden we got this full cipher, which really played a big part in sort of creating another puzzle for us to solve, a serious puzzle that we spent some real time solving. And then looking at more evidence that we made copies of, there was the cipher, which was its own little big giant hard puzzle. But then going back to more evidence, we got these criminal records on two pages. We got letters from the, fian from the wife about breaking out that had little puzzle in the poem. We got land records with details. Now these again were not very useful for us. We didn't really make use of them. That's a shame, a little bit of a missed opportunity there. But it was so cool to get these different kinds of evidences. We got a diagram of crime scene. There was the sketching. We got biographies of the people. There was the letter that Vincent Derrick wrote. I mean, and then we got days and days of dense catalogs from each day in our case that we had to wait until the subsequent day. Five full double pages from 7 a.m. till 10 p.m. of cab logs. Six pages, no, five pages of cab logs that were super dense. Now, leaving aside uh, how well those were handled, it was a very impressive amount of evidence of varying types that was really cool to sink our teeth into. Now, what did I do with my notes? My review notes. All right, so that was also a positive. I love the letters. I love when we get letters in this game, in games to read because you're reading the psychology of someone else. You're sort of like peeking behind the scenes, looking vicariously at someone's personal life when they write a letter. I find that always really fun when you get a letter. You're also wondering, did they really write the letter? Did someone else write it? There's just something great about reading letters. Okay, so all of those things were great things that I had fun, that I really liked. Let me catch up in the chat before I start talking about some of the negative stuff. AJ said, I did solve the cipher. It took two days using similar logic to Jesse. Once I realized Perkins worked for both, I figured the heading was either addressed to Moriarty or Balfour. AJ says, I was astounded how quickly you all figured out the Lambert's Balfour robbery. That took me ages. That was pretty fun. And Tina says, I couldn't follow the case and the cab logs so much, that much, so I focused my efforts on the cipher. John says, yeah, I agree the evidence envelope is a very cool idea and concept, but it would have been better if they interacted with each other more or had us return to them more. Mainly, they just fed us some addresses. AJ said, this felt as immersive as Gaslight with a lot less bugs. I'd like to have spent more time at the cricket match. Carriage logs took me days to slog through. Well, I am going to, before we're done with this, I'm going to talk about what I thought in comparison to Gaslight. I'm going to find my review notes first, though. All right, let's keep hearing what you guys thought. So AJ Hunter played Gaslight as well. That's very useful. That's very helpful to, to be able to talk about. It sounds like, AJ, you're, you liked this better than Gaslight. Is that correct? Where did my notes go? What did I do with my notes? Ah, here. Okay. AJ said, I also love the clue points that had the time variations. That's going to be interesting. It sounds like AJ and I had some different takes on some things. Overall, yes, because I thought it hung together better and less bugs. And did you enjoy the cab log stuff, AJ? John says, I believe someone said they cut Goodwin out of the new version. I can see why. While I thought the explosion was cool twist, it did raise the question of why not blow up Balfour himself? Yeah, like if you're going to kill someone, why not kill the other guy? 
Interesting. Well, we're going to look at the Space Cowboys version in detail and see if we can figure some stuff out. Okay, another thing I, I loved was there were some really perplexing items that we really spent time chewing on, like the cipher, like the letter from the wife about the escape. That was something that we read through once and we thought we understood it, and then we kept coming to it over and over and over again. Um, I thought the newspapers were really good. Often we read the newspapers and it feels exhausting. There's so much, so much irrelevant that has nothing to do with our case that's international or whatever that you feel like you don't really want to read, but you force yourself to read. In this case, there were four newspapers, but somehow they were all shorter, more breezy, more national. So it was not unpleasant to read through the newspapers. Did you guys feel the same way, or am I just imagining that? Um, and as AJ was pointing out, there was something very nice about how fair that cipher was. There were lots of clues in it that logically could be deduced, like the heading of it, the kinds of digits that were done, the sentence breaks, the uh, word breaks. It, it sort of was, it was a really fair cipher and it was hard enough that it was enjoyable. I think I probably, I have one problem with it that I will talk about. John says, I like the concept of the double agent, but once again, I would have liked us to be more involved with Lloyd as a character. So the twist meant more to us. Okay. So let me talk about, um, A.J. Hunter says, I had no luck with the Gaslight Cipher. The Gaslight Cipher was a lot harder. Okay, let me talk about some cons here, because I had quite a bit of them for this game. First of all, let's start with the one... Okay, wait, before I do the cons, one more big pro. In fact, this is the pro that if you, if you were going to advise anyone about making a big case, the best bang for your buck to make a case more, more feel more special and more epic and uh, more unique as an experience is breaking things into acts. It's something we've talked about. Some games do it, some games don't. It's almost always a win. It's almost always a nice way to break the game up and have events happen that propel the story forward. And the idea that this case was broken up into these days and things are happening each day new little mysteries, new little twists, and people are getting killed off. There was a real sense of danger when people started dying. And you could go back and talk to people. Like, it was cool that we talked to Meeks on day one. He's like, yeah, it's a slow day. One person got injured the second day or third day. He's like, there's five bodies. I don't know what to do. I'm overloaded. So that's, in general, a very big plus, and I love any game that's a long game, but that we get these acts is always wonderful. Now, let's talk about some of the cons, and they're pretty, I think they're non-trivial for me. There are some real marks against this. As a punchline, I will say, I liked Adventures by Gaslight substantially more than this one. And that's sort of the punchline. Now let's talk about this. I mean, I really did enjoy this. And it's really fun to get the questions right. And it was really fun to work as a team. But I do see a bunch of problems here. The first one, to me, was the deadliest and had the biggest risk of making this what could have been unpleasant. And I think if you're not ready for this, it could easily cause an unpleasant experience. And that was sort of the, as a general comment, the pacing of information in the game. And that first day, when you get that first piece of, that first brochure, which has got, you know, 20 people's names on it. And they're sort of almost all generic. It's probably got more than 20 people. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. 25 people's names on it. And they're sort of all sort of uh, confusable 
all of these people work for one, are all related to Belfort. They all own real estate companies or something financial. They all are cricket players at this one club. And here are all of these cricket players at another club that seem like they're not important. And it's a huge, it was a huge overload that day one. And I felt at the end of day one, like I couldn't catch my breath almost. And I felt that way through much of this game. There was never a moment where we didn't have a dozen places that we could go. We never had a lull. It was always just, there's a million people to talk to. And then when you combine that with the worrying about running out of time and not getting to a person before it's too late, that's just too much. It, it was overload. And it was overload of people that weren't distinguishable, that didn't have really different personalities. That was not, that's not the right way to do it. It's not to say you can't have 20 people or 30 people or 40 people in this case, but they have to be doled out more carefully. And as a general concept for these games, to be most enjoyable, I mean, you could make the case that what you want is you want to create a case. It's fine to say, let's give the player the experience of being overloaded with details and facts and people. That's a reasonable goal on paper, and it could be a unique experience, and that's kind of what this was. But I think if you're talking about game design, what's most enjoyable, it is far more enjoyable to have ups and downs like a roller coaster, to not just be giving someone a fire hose of information constantly. People don't want to watch an action movie where there's never a quiet scene. You must have the lulls to make the highs in contrast. And the best of these games, and Dave Neal is really good at this. Dave Neal is really good at a bunch of this stuff. But the best of these games have a certain pattern. And that pattern is bottlenecks. And the best adventure games, the, the old text adventures had the same flavor, and the best computer games have this flavor too, which is you get into a new area, you get a bunch of new interesting stuff, and you get bottlenecked. You get to a point where you say, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to progress. I've gone to the five people that know this person. Now. I don't know where to go. And you sit there and you think, and you think, how are we going to get information about person X? How will we find out where they were? How will we find out where the murder weapon would be? Let's think. Let's think. What could we go to? What store could we go to? Who might know? You must have those moments, those bottleneck moments, where you get stuck and you don't know where to go, and then you spend an hour and you go, ah, let's go to that doctor that was mentioned. And then when you go there, all of a sudden, blah, 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 you get 10 more people you can visit. And then you exhaust those for a while, and then you bottleneck again. This game had no bottlenecks. It was just a fire hose of names that never stopped. And we eventually ran them all down or ran out of time on a day but it never ended. And on a related note, one of the things that I love most about these Sherlock Holmes games is doing a little tourism in Victorian England. This game had some paragraphs where we learned a little bit about things like how to build a carriage and stuff, but I would say that compared to most Sherlock Holmes cases, and certainly compared to Adventure by Gaslight, there were much, much fewer entries here that were not importantly related to our case, or at least densely filled with facts related to our case. And that meant very little opportunity to catch our breath, to relax, to take some of the tension out so that it could be built up. And I think I really experienced for most of this case, except for maybe one session or two, feeling like everything was bouncing around in my head. Like my working memory had to work overtime to keep in mind what 
thread we were working on at any given time. I never had time to really relax and enjoy trying to chew on stuff. Now we try to manufacture those occasionally. And sometimes you force yourself to say, let's stop. Let's leave aside this. Let's work on this. Let's think about this. And we made those moments for ourselves. But I really think a better design game would have tried to create more moments of quiet, lull in the action, a little bit of a bottleneck. Let us appreciate the environment and the characters. And let's see, checking with the chat a little bit here. Um, A.G. Henderson, I'd like to follow Northrop more. And it says, all in all, I think much more positive than negative. It's just very, so a very good case, real advanced one at that, just what we, we needed. I think that's all completely fair. I love that Anna, Anna really got into this one and had some real insight here. This is an advanced case. This absolutely should not be tackled by anyone who's not done a lot of Sherlock Holmes cases and isn't really ready for something advanced. I would call this the most advanced mystery detective game that we've played. I would even call it more advanced than Gumshoe, which is longer but much less convoluted. This is the most complex, difficult, taxing, work-intensive Sherlock Holmes case and any detective case of any that we've played, I believe. You let me know if you disagree with that. John says, one criticism I remember reading somewhere is that the cases could have been broken up into separate cases like regular Sherlock Holmes consulting degree. Detective, I agree to an extent. I wish all came together for a bigger conclusion. For example, the whole jewelry thread involves a lot of coincidences. Doesn't really tie into the end. I know, we talked about whether it's coincidences or not. I, I would sort of disagree with you there and give it a little more credit for that. But I agree it doesn't really tie in too much. But... I don't know if it's coincidences. Like if one person does something and another person takes advantage of that and gets the idea and is inspired to do something because of that, I wouldn't call that a coincidence. I would call that life. So that was more fair to me than you thought it was fair. John says, also a bit of an anticlimax. We didn't really prevent anything. Kearney was just released and came back to us on his own. AJ says, I was thinking that too. Maybe a series of questions after each day, there was a sense of completion. Anna says, agree, pacing was an ideal. Anna says, good point with the questions after every day. Shay says, we didn't really get a personal feel for the characters in the game, which also had too many leads to fall. We didn't do, know which ones were prioritized. AJ says, Gaslight has more tourism. Um, Jonathan said, I enjoyed Gaslight more and more manageable core set of characters. Still, okay, everyone here is saying something some of the points here are another big point to talk about that is worth chewing on a little bit. And that is the sort of emotional involvement in the characters. I mentioned Wiggins was sort of the emotional attachment for me during this case. But one of the ways this case really suffered was no one to really care about. All of our bad guys were sort of boring bad guys. Moriarty was a little bit interesting, but we never deal with him personally or his henchmen personally. We spend a lot of time talking to Belfour and his 12 people that are all financial people that all feel generic. None of them feel that interesting. We get a little backstory about Belfour's history, but, and the case presented to us is Kearney's disappearing, but he seems to be fine. Like it was not we were not emotionally invested in the lives of these people that we were investigating. The closest we came was Vincent Derrick, which who we kind of cared about because we got this weird letter from the beyond the grave, but we weren't able to pursue that one much. There were very few people to really care about in this case. No one was really at risk or danger that we cared about. We weren't trying to really help someone. Typically in these cases, someone comes to us, they're like pleading, you gotta save my wife or whatever. We've played some Dave Neal cases that brought me to tears. That's how emotionally connected we were and motivated to solve things. Here, not only were we not sort of emotionally, psychologically care about these people, but the game was like hinting to us, eh, this guy's really fine. You don't even have to find him. He's gonna come back on his own. 
And Vincent Derrick, he's already dead and buried long ago. You're not going to save him, so... And the game was sort of hinting to us that maybe you're not... Like, it wasn't clear to us what... Another problem was it wasn't clear to us what the game wanted from us. Jonathan and Anna were thinking, are we going to be able to save the world from this big bombing? Or not. We didn't know what questions were going to be asked of us. There were so many cases. Are we just supposed to try to understand all the stuff that's going on in the world with the stock market and stuff? It was not... It didn't really have any importance to us, and we didn't know what we were going to be asked about. That was weird, and in fact, in the end, we did nothing. We solved nothing, right? Holmes explains it all, and maybe we tell him where the plates were, but it's weird that we didn't stop anything. These two people, these two business leaders, Belfort and Moriarty, they're just... They're two criminals fighting over a little bit of property who controls the underworld in London. That is not very compelling task to give us. And we weren't we weren't important. We weren't asked. To, we didn't really solve it. And the main case guy just walks in. So that was really anticlimactic. I mean, it was climactic that we got the questions right. But as far as the compelling cases, it was really on the very low end of cases to be to find compelling. If you play Adventures by Gaslight, it's not that much better, except if you read Jonathan and I's patch, because we added some extra stuff that make it a little more compelling. Let's see, going, going back into the chat. Uh, good points about lack of emotional investment, Lloyd Perkins being a prankster. There were a lot of characters that we didn't have much time to, we didn't spend much time with any of them. That's one of the big differences with Adventures by Gaslight is Adventures by Gaslight felt like a very small core cast of characters that we really spent some time with. And here it was almost the opposite. We almost didn't spend any amount of time with any one character. There were so many characters to talk to. The only exception I will make is that we really connected with Wiggins. This felt like this case was sort of like Wiggins make your bones. Wiggins, here's your real test. Go out there. And Wiggins did rise to the occasion. And that was pretty cool. On to some more um, small points. Um, I thought there was too much work with the cab logs. That to me was a missed opportunity. And that's, that's, it's a tough thing to say because you could, you could imagine if you want a really hard case, a real case, a difficult long case, you could say, Hey, look, um, this is the most realistic situation a detective might face a huge amount of data from these cab logs. None of them are cut and dry. None of them by themselves really prove anything. And we did use the cab logs to find one place. But I would say from a game design perspective, problematic. For a couple reasons. First of all, the amount of work involved to find where places were. With Adventures by Gaslight, we had like half a page of one day's cab log. And that was the sweet spot that like rewarded us for finding each of those places, tracking them and asking ourselves, is this related? How could this play a role? With five days of double page things, it was too much. It was too much work for us to do for too little payoff. In every single mystery detective game, one thing that's should be in the minds of the designer is that unlike real life, in real life, you can ask the detectives tracking a serial killer to send one guy and say, for the next year, your job is going to be go through parking tickets and maybe you'll find something useful and maybe you won't. And you'll be going through parking tickets, you'll be going through phone logs, you'll be going through rental, uh, car rentals and Three of you are never going to find anything. You will waste your year. But the one person may find one thing. And in real life, that's okay. In a mystery game, you cannot ask players to spend 30 hours going through cab logs 
and maybe find nothing. That is unpleasant. So as a writer of these games, you have to trade off the amount of work you make the player do, and hopefully the amount of cleverness that if they've got it, they can bypass doing much of that work. And then you have to find a way to hint to them how they know when they found it and give them that aha moment when they do. And the cab logs failed on most of those counts. It was not clear that our time was going to be well spent. It was not clear to us how sure we were going to be of what we were supposed to find. And when we found stuff, we didn't really have aha moments except for one. And then we weren't sure, like, how close does it have to be to a place to be the real place that they went? So I, if I were doing it, I would, I would advise them to figure out a way to make one day of cab logs be very significant. Make it be maybe hard to find some detail in it, but when you find it, you know, ah, we've got it. And then have that satisfaction. Um, okay. In the creator's defense for a second, this was their first foray into this lengthy of a game. They were true pioneers back in 85. Well, that's a great point. Because I may have wrongly said that this was like came after Adventures by Gaslight. Of course, Adventures by Gaslight were written by a French couple, not the originals. But you are absolutely right. This was the first long, epic, long form Sherlock Holmes consulting detective case. You are absolutely right. They completely broke ground by creating Sherlock Holmes consulting detective. Then they made the mansion murders, which were standalone cases. And then they created something quite amazing. The first big giant long form case that spanned multiple days. That is pretty incredible. And it says it would have been overwhelming alone is great to hear your thoughts and ideas, even between streams. Great week for me. Real treat in the winter break. Thanks everyone. Although I'm exhausted. Yeah. Anyway, you, Feel free to leave now while I'm talking. I've still got more to say. We still got Space Cowboys, but you can leave and then come back and check this later if you want. Okay, so that was the cab logs. Another thing that I missed here, and I don't know if you are, um, if you're in the same boat as me, I sort of missed some longer entries. We got a, we got a, we got a bunch of longer entries some cool ones that I really appreciated. But I seem to remember in Adventure by Gaslight more... There were small entries in all of these games there are, but I feel like there were more like two-page entries in Adventures by Gaslight that really were interesting. There's one clue in Adventure by Gaslight that's like two pages long that we probably reread a dozen times looking for details and juicy bits. And uh, that, those weren't present here. There weren't as many long entries. There were a couple of great ones. Mostly they were just for flavor and atmosphere, and they were done very well. But I think I would have liked more of those. I think for my preferences in terms of balance, I want longer paragraph, longer pages to read that really fill things out and connect us to the characters a little bit more than I got here. John says, to touch on time, I did not find it super interesting in this game. I found it more interesting in Gumshoe, more unique passages to see in Gumshoe based on time for better and worse. Okay, let's talk about that then. Let's talk about the time element and maybe some recommendations. Let's see if we all have the same recommendations and our same thoughts. As Jonathan points out, and as AJ was saying, Gumshoe, which is behind me there, right there, is the biggest of any of these games. It's got 10 days set in the 30s in LA that are connected and spanned, but more like 10 cases. This felt like a box of 10 cases all jumbled up and mixed up into one case. Gumshoe feels much more modularly divided. But the Queen's Park was their first foray into this, into this time system where you've got days and a certain amount of time per day and where going to a lead costs a certain amount of time. 
and then they revisited it again in Gumshoe, which I think is like 86 or so, so a couple years later. Now, I played Gumshoe first. In both games, the official rules say it takes you time to travel, and you're not going to have time to do everything, and you'll probably want to play the game multiple times if you really want to understand everything. Now, let's start with that last part. You'll probably want to play the game, you may want to play the game multiple times to understand everything. That is a gross misstatement and a dangerous attitude to take. There is no way to understand even a small fraction of this game playing by the official time rules. In general, these games, these Sherlock Holmes games, were seem to have been designed in a time where the designer was okay having a little less control, a little less curation of the user experience. And what's absolutely true in Queen's Park time system and Gumshoe is, the designers are fine with you missing out on a huge critical element of the case that you will not be able to understand the case if you miss, and you might not know you've missed it. <laughs> you might just choose, if you follow by the real rules, to go one set of places, and you won't have time to go to these others, and you will, you will have missed the entirety of that whole thread and question, and there'd be no way you could get it right if you missed that. So a more fair, true way to say that is, for the rules, you cannot play by the rules and under, and you won't be able to answer the question. You, it won't be a fair mystery for you to try to solve when you get to the end. So then you've got a couple choices. You could say, well, I'm the kind of player that just wants a quick experience. That would be like playing Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective and trying to answer it quickly. I'm just going to guess at things at the end. I'll probably be wrong. But then it'll be fun, and then maybe I'll go back and see where I missed, where I could have learned it. Or you could do what the rules say, play through it once. Now, you, 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 you could allow yourself to look at the questions, but you certainly couldn't read the answers after your first playthrough if you wanted to play through it again. You could play through it once and then say, okay, I'm going to play through it again and try to learn more. I think if you looked at what we did, we probably played through it three or four times. We probably used up as much time in the game three or four times, and we had to take very careful notes to make sure we found all the important places, and we still missed one critical place that we only got by reading through the book. In addition, we very early decided to jettison this rule about travel times and just completely ignore it. And there was a reason for that. It's that that idea, which you could imagine might look good on paper, and in fact, we played one game where it worked, which was Razorhurst. But in general, that idea of saying, well, we need to go to all the clues in this neighborhood so that we don't waste time by traveling and coming back. We realized after our halfway through our first session that that was going to make us miserable. That was a very unpleasant rule. Now, why was it so unpleasant? Number one, it's unpleasant because just keeping track of time passing is fiddly and was unpleasant. The other thing is it was eating up more of our clock, which we went way beyond. But the other real problem with that was that instead of focusing on what was interesting to us, what leads were most interesting and most promising, it was forcing us to try to do micro-optimization of clue searching so that we search for clues in the same neighborhood. That meant we were like doing like a breadth first search instead of a depth first search. Instead of saying, okay, let's follow this lead logically and keep it in our mind as we do, we were saying, okay, we'll follow a little bit of this lead, then we'll follow a little bit of this lead because it happens to be in this neighborhood, then we'll go to this place that we don't think is relevant, but it's here ne nearby. That was making an already difficult situation, keeping all these names and places in our mind. That was making it, exacerbating that terribly. And the best thing we ever did was get rid of that travel time rule and just say, 
we're going to go where we want. So here would be my advice to people who are considering playing this game. There, we've been warned before we started that you have to, you can't completely ignore the time thing because there's certain places you go where it's like, if it's after 6 p.m. it's closed or if it's before six, you'll find someone might be dead or whatever. And as Jonathan was made an interesting comment, he said, this was better than in Gumshoe. Let me see how Jonathan put it. Jonathan said, to touch on time, I did not find it super interesting in this game. I found it, more, oh, Jonathan found it more interesting in Gumshoe, more unique passages to see in Gumshoe based on time for better and worse. Jonathan says, it might be interesting to play this game like Gumshoe, where each player got their own timesheet. Playing with a couple of players provide greater chance. Okay, I think I have a slightly different take on that. Gumshoe had a lot more branching points where you could choose to do this, you could follow this person, or you could go here, and a lot more entries that were time-based. And Jonathan is right that they were more sort of more fully part of the system of Gumshoe. Gumshoe much more embraced a sort of choose-your-own-adventure paths and time. But Gumshoe, and there was much more of it, but Gumshoe also felt to me like it was much easier to, if you didn't go everywhere and allow yourself to do all of the things on all the different times, you'd have a much more random experience and possibly miss out on some important stuff. It felt like the time element was much less important here. And whereas Jonathan seemed to have preferred the gumshoe, I preferred that it played much less of a role here. And in fact, my recommendation is that we have never played a game gumshoe, Queen's Park. I have never played a game with this time element that I liked that I thought was an improvement. It's a little bit cool that you go to a place and something's happened and you've missed it, or you come back and it's a different time. But I would say, in general, there are better ways to do it, and I have never played one of these games where you have to keep track of your time and where things happen at different times that I've enjoyed, or that I felt would be was an improvement over not having that. So here would be my recommendations for someone and put a marker here. Here are my recommendations if you are playing this game. First of all, don't worry about travel times. Completely take that out of your mind. Go where your, your heart leads you. Next, if you're interested in this time mechanic, and there are reasons to be, it's kind. there are elements where it's fun, and there are certain clues where it's kind of important, I would start tracking your time at 9 a.m. as the game says. Don't worry about travel times, but keep track of how much time each lead takes. And then do what we did, which is when you get to 10 p.m., just say we're doing overtime. And go on as long as you want and play till you're finished. Now, I'm talking about the original game. I can't speak for the Space Cowboys. That's a little bit different. Play, keep track of your 10 p.m. time. If after 10 p.m., which I think you'll be spending like another two-thirds of each day chasing down leads, I would advise you chase down all the leads, play through this game once. I think it's too weird to play through it multiple times, but people who have tried that can correct me if they disagree and they liked it that way. I don't like it that way. I think it's better for you to play every day, fully go through every lead you want to go to. Just consider it to be after 7 p.m. So you'll... You may get to some clues that you'll never see because you get there after midnight and they won't, and it's too late. I would advise, so that's the first level of modifications. If you want the smallest number of modifications, that's what I would do. <coughs> Track your time on each lead, but allow yourself an unlimited time after 10 p.m. But when you get to a lead and it's after 10 p.m., treat it as after 10 p.m. That means you do have some incentive to go to places early where things might happen that you might miss. The next step up in terms of if you're a completionist, if you want to read things, 
would be to do what we did, which I would also recommend for the best experience, at least in my view, which is I would look at those coup points and do what I did, go through and mark every single one. This is cheating a little bit more than giving yourself unlimited time. I think the unlimited time is just a different way to avoid playing through it multiple times. I think it's much better to play through multiple days. If you wanted to play the day over again at 9, that would be another great way to do it. You could play day 1 to 10 p.m. and then start day 1 again. And day 1 again until you did everything. That might even be give you better opportunity to go to places early. I think that's what I did with Gumshoe. That would have been fair too. The next level of cheating that I think brings a better experience with such a game would be to do what we did here, which is compare each day. So from day one through day four and see which entries change and deliberately go to any entry that's going to change for tomorrow. That's a cheat. But if you want to enjoy the reading and the experience and the atmosphere, I think that's worth your time rather than trying to guess what's going to have changed and expired. Now, you can't do that with the new version, so we'll talk about that. Um, then the at the far end of the cheats, which I would still recommend, but that's going to depend on your style, would be when you finish this case, there are some Sherlock Holmes cases that if you read everything in the book, you'd understand everything easily. And so you don't want to give yourself that hint. I don't think that's how this case is. I think Adventures by Gaslight and Queen's Park Affair were designed with an, uh, what's the right term? There's a word for it, it escapes my mind at the moment, but it's some, a certain aesthetic, a certain philosophy. And that philosophy is even if you read everything, you're going to struggle to really understand all the questions and answers. So my advice would be, do every day complete. Read every single thing that's available for you to read on every day. And then when you get to the end, you skim through that clue book and read the ones that you missed. Even with that, you're going to have a challenge answering these questions. And along the same lines of advice, this is a game you can pick up the 84 original for 30 bucks or so, and the new version for 40, I would write all over it. Don't even give it a second thought. For that cost, for the amount of experience you're going to get and the difficulty of this, keep notes, mark things you've read. Anyone have any different advice they want to give to people about playing the game where you disagree with me on any of these parts? Are there certain cheats I've recommended that you want to disagree with that you think would lead to a lesser experience? Anna says, I agree, timed events between days. I think that's a nice, concise way to say it. If we were to give one lesson to people interested in having time pass and different things get gated by time, there's an easy solution for that. The solution is events happen between days. Break your game into acts and have events happen between the acts at the introduction or ends of an act where the player reads a new introduction, do not worry about within a day, within an act, don't worry about time passing. Duke of Zill says, two detectives both playing the same day simultaneously. That's how Gumshoe says, and it's a little weird, uh, uh, but you could do it. I think maybe go through it multiple days. AJ Hunter says, that's how I did it. I marked all the coup points at the beginning. Well, Duke of Zill, you shouldn't be listening to any of this because we could absolutely be giving away spoilers in this video until you play it. AJ Hunter said, I actually like the time system and use the travel time, although I would change that. I would change that after the experience. That's interesting. I will say one more thing on this before I come back and look at more chat channels. We were told that it's important to use the time system. There are posts people have asked. In fact, it might have been Jonathan that asked. I don't remember. People have asked on Board Game Geek, can you just skip the time system here? And the answer was no. It's really critical. 
for certain parts of the game. I think I would disagree with that. In fact, I'd go farther. I'd say I absolutely see why someone would say that. It absolutely can be an element of the game that if you plan better, there were a couple things that we went to right in the morning, maybe just one, that was important for us to do. And if we hadn't, we would have missed out on it. But I would disagree. I would say that it wasn't so significant. I would say if you played and didn't pay any attention to time, and when you got to one of those, you know, dozen or so places that said, if it's before noon, go here, if it's afternoon, go here, and you just allowed yourself to read both, or said, we're going to read the early one first, and then we're going to pass through and read the next one, I really don't think there's anything wrong with that. And if the time stuff really bugs you, I would say, don't worry about it. It does, it's not going to hurt your overall experience. You might feel a little bit more clever if you went to the things at the right time, but I would say you could track your time and then if you get to someplace too late, just make a mental note. All right, we'd come back tomorrow or I'd send my other detective. That's what I did with Gumshoe. Um, Jonathan, Anna, what do you think about that? If you played without any any recording of time and just when you got to a place that said if it's before go here if it's after here go here do you really think it would hurt your experience if you just read the earliest one and then the later one i don't remember any real place where it was like it should have been an exclusive or like it like i don't remember any place where like you got two different things based on what time you got there and you really should never read both they were almost always of the flavor of if you got there early, you got a little bit extra information and then you could go there later anyway and you get a little more information. Anyone disagree with me about doing that? Let's see what the chat says while I check up on my other stuff. So I've got my advice about how I would handle it. I think I probably would do with what I, yes. I would probably do with it what I did with Gumshoe, which is I would just replay a day over again. So if I, I played the first day tracking time and if I got to a lead that said, hey, is it before noon? And it wasn't, I would say, okay, I'm gonna make a note of this lead. And I'm going to replay this day again when I finish it and then go to that place on time. I would not try to play through to the end of the game having skipped visiting someplace just because I got there late. John says, I agree. Time could be more easily ignored in this game and more easily ignored than people have suggested on Board Game Geek. And it says, my problem with the time element, is it an adventure game or a puzzler? If it's the latter, you don't need this time nonsense. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, if you want to choose your own adventure game where you're embracing the chaoticness of it, then you have these branching things and time. But if it's a mystery, we don't want it. Okay, let's see if there are any other design lessons to talk about. I think we've covered most of them. I will talk about one little thing I was thinking of. I think it relates to some of our experience with the cases being all interwoven and feeling like 10 different cases that are tied together and then the end questions. I think from a design, design standpoint, in the same way that I've argued, you need to have these lulls, highs and lows and periods of sort of quiescence of bottlenecking where you don't know where to go, where you can chew on it, and then you get more information rather than a flood of action and facts. I think in terms of pacing, and I think most of the complaints about this game have to, something to do with pacing. I think another design element here that was a miss was, a miss was 
I think what you want in such a big long epic case is you want little mini mysteries that the player can wrap up and tie into a little bow and say we've done that, we've solved it, we've figured it out. Now they might not know how that fits into the bigger overarching mystery at the end, and but ideally what you'd love is lots of little mini mysteries that take players different amounts of time to figure out, but that they can solve. And this game leaned more towards leaving everything open-ended till the end. Maybe the one exception was the Balfour Jewels, although AJ Hunter says that really caused problems for him. But we had so many little mini cases, Picker's death, Kearney's disappearance, uh, the Northrop stuff, so many that seemed like they were left hanging at the end. And I think that's less satisfying. I think it would have been more fun if we could have wrapped up Ormond's mystery after two days and really gotten the satisfaction of solving that and been like, yes, we got it. We now we finally figured it out and then figured out a couple more and then gotten to the end and been like, okay, now we know these four big pieces. How does it fit into the bit main one? But because so many of these were open-ended and, and left hanging, we didn't get as much of a feeling of satisfying the big overarching puzzle. It just felt like all of them were left open-ended. And there's something a little bit unsatisfying about that. I don't know if everyone agrees with me. That's kind of how I felt. Um... I do think when you have a bunch of little cases, if you're trying to make a big epic experience, ideally you'd have the little cases get wrapped up in a bow and solved by the players before the end, sort of like a finale climax that eventually when you get to the end, you have solved a bunch of these little puzzles, but then you have to fit them into the bigger puzzle. And I don't think that's what we got here. We sort of knew it was Moriarty versus Belfort at the end, and we were just trying to solve a couple of the open-ended little puzzles that we never got solutions to. And maybe better communication to the players about what you're sort of expecting of them and what the trajectory of the case is going to be. Is there going to be a big explosion you're trying to stop? Is someone in danger that you care about? Here, we didn't know till we read the questions what the game really wanted for us. Okay. Last comments about this game maybe in relation to Gaslight. Okay, couple more questions. AJ says breaking up the puzzles more like each day would have been nice. Yeah. Okay. So a uh, couple more points. This is the second time. Well, okay. This is more philosophy of design of a case. I find the best of these cases, and Dave Neal is really good at this, and he's explicitly talked about this as a philosophy. The best of these cases have an end where you cannot think of a consistent solution. You cannot make a, you cannot come up with in your brain a story that doesn't have contradictions. And then the puzzle is finding that one explanation that however improbable is the one that's not impossible, that's your answer. This is Sherlock Holmes' idea. And we've now played a couple of these Sherlock Holmes cases Adventures by Gaslight in Queen's Park. Actually, Adventures by Gaslight kind of had this flavor, but we weren't too satisfied with the ending. This one didn't achieve that, though. Whether it was Kearney missing or Ormond missing or Picker's death, those were not situations where the facts were so contradictory that we couldn't come up with a consistent solution. Those were the lesser kind of mysteries. Those are the mysteries where 
There were lots of possible explanations, but none of them were satisfying. They all relied on sort of making some judge psychological judgment about motives and information that felt like it was missing. I think when we got to the end of this case, it felt like there was missing information that we needed to solve the case. Now, we made our best guesses, and we were right. So in that sense, it was very satisfying. And one design philosophy that some of the Sherlock Holmes consulting detective cases have embraced is the idea that you will get to the end, you will not have enough information, and you will have to make a best guess. But there may be multiple possibilities that would be consistent. And you just have to try to find the one that's most aligned with the writers and that feels most psychologically consistent with the motives of the characters. It's still good. It was still a great experience and a great fun and a great mystery, and we got it right. So that's a testament to the writers and everything. But I do think that's a tier below the best of these cases where you get to the end and you say, these facts do not make sense. I'm missing something. I have jumped to a conclusion or overlooked something or I'm not thinking about a possibility that would bring these facts into consistent gel. That's the most satisfying tier of these mysteries, and we didn't really get that here. Chat says, we haven't even looked at the Space Cowboys version yet. Well, we're about to. I'm just wrapping up my final thoughts. You guys give your final thoughts now before we get to Space Cowboy. That was my last little point here. Bunch of possible solutions. So for my, for my money, this is the most difficult, complicated, and most exhausting, work-demanded, team beneficial of these games, of any of these mystery games. It's not to be taken lightly. You should only be attacking this if you're a real expert, but you can get it all right. And it is, has got some great moments and some great little puzzles. I would rank it below Adventure by, Adventures by Gaslight in terms of overall enjoyability of the world and the story and the characters. Although you could absolutely play both and say Adventures by Gaslight has got an unsatisfying end and the cipher's too hard, etc. Or have other complaints about it. Don't like the ending bad wrap-up, bad solution, whereas Queen's Park feels more fair. I can absolutely see that. So depending on what you're in it for, you might like one over the other. They're both super long. This one feels more overwhelming, more of an overload for me, though. So I think really you better be really prepared for this one. And I would, I would want a team on this one more than I would want on Gaslight. Final thoughts here. I believe I agree with these points. Mainly wish for more investment in the cast and the ending seemed pretty anticlimactic. Good, says Jonathan. Anna says, final thoughts, good advanced level case. We could give some recommendations that make it better. Yep, I mean, great case. And I love that Anna liked it, seemed to like it, get into it a little bit more. I, I think we all... It was a wonderful experience. Anytime you can spend 45 hours on a case really chewing it. And even when we got to the end this session, it was agonizing putting those guesses on paper. That's a pretty cool moment. We created our own climax in our fear of the getting the right answer. So that was pretty cool. AJ Hunter says, last thought, wondering if Moriarty's brother, the Colonel, is intended to be Colonel Sebastian Moran, right-hand man in the canon, referring to the part where Moriarty bought bought a carriage. I do like some of the theories we came up with outside of the case. Shay had one about Moriarty planning to bomb the London Tower to get the plates. I love that idea. The, so Jonathan and Anna, you actually got your bombing provided by Shay, a little postscript. 
Actually, that brings us to the last thing to say before we look at the Space Cowboys version was, I was wondering if this game needs a patch. Would a patch help? At the end of Gaslight, I really felt like we needed a patch. Jonathan and I wrote like a 45 page patch with hint, a whole big hint system to help you solve the cipher if you needed it, and a whole new epilogue ending, and a couple more clues to make the solution make more sense. I'm not sure you need that here, although you could absolutely add a couple tweaks, but I don't think this one is worth it. This one doesn't really need it. And I think it would be harder to do it in place without messing with stuff. So I guess not. I guess this one doesn't need a patch. Does anyone disagree with me? Doesn't seem so. Okay, so we're going to open up the, que the Space Cowboys version look through the evidence, the newspapers, and the books. Might take us a half hour or so. John says, hey, a couple fixes to make it easier to find Luella. That's a good point. And you don't miss Meeks from the first day. You're right. There are some fixes, a couple fixes you could do, but maybe nothing that isn't more easily solved by saying go through the whole book when you're done. All right, we're going to take an eight minute break. And then for those of you who want to look through the Queens Park Carlton House Queens Park Affair Box from Space Cowboys in 2017 can join us for that. I'll see you in eight minutes for our last session here today.
Okay, we're back. Let me tell you all again how much it has been a real, real pleasure to share this experience with you guys playing these games. Such a long game is particularly special, and I really feel lucky that I've had such a great group of people to share the experience with, and I'm glad that you enjoyed it as well. <clears throat> okay. Let's look at the Space Cowboys version. And don't feel like you have to stick around for this. You can always skim it later. Someone posted a comment on one of my videos. I, paste, I posted a video about an OBS extension that I wrote, a plugin that I wrote. And it was like a 15 minute video. And the person wrote, I'm at minute eight and you're still talking and demonstrating the problems with the text plugin that you're replacing. Why is it taking you so long to get to the point? I'm miserable. I hate this, but I'm not skipping ahead because I don't want to miss anything important. And I said, I hear you. I sympathize. Here's a tip to lead a happier life. <laughs> skip ahead. Let yourself skip ahead on YouTube videos. It will lead to a more pleasant life. Don't worry about missing important stuff. There's too much. Life is too short to not skip fast forward on the YouTube videos. All right, let's start by opening up the evidence envelope that came with the new version compared to our others. Our original one came in a small envelope. I think these are all basically the same pieces of evidence, but they're just in a different form. So let's see. I see. So you get your time sheet. Oops. You get your time sheet in the new envelope here. Some of the uh, new versions of the 1984 have it in this triple list, whereas in the one I have, they're straight. They're just one column per. Okay. So here's. In our original, we got a nice handwriting looking one on different paper. This looks like it's meant to be a photocopy. It's not as nice. It's like, I mean, it's like meant to be a piece of paper, but it's clearly fake. It's not, it is not that paper. Same thing here. Here's our letter that in the original looked like a real typed letter with real creases. Here is, these aren't, these aren't, these don't have, have dimension. They're clearly like a photo scan of this. So it doesn't really look like a believable letter. Same thing here. This is not a folded piece of paper. It's just a printed design. But here is this brochure is now just a single-sided card. Same information. They've changed the date slightly. I do not know why they did all this. In fact, they changed the date two years in the future. Do not know why they would have done all that. Here we got a nice little brochure. They've just reformatted it to a card. Then we've got a bunch of business cards here. Ron Marsh, Daniel Oliver, some nice art, Liberator Construction, and Pickerton. Okay, so these look, these might be a little bit better than the originals. Originals just look like standard business cards. All right. Then what, here's our betting tickets. Actually, these look pretty good. These look pretty identical to the ones in the original. Compare them side by side. There's the original above the new ones. Actually, those look pretty identical and maybe even more interesting that they're different colors. These didn't seem to play any role in anything. And then here's the Aberdeen receipt. Hey, something seems missing. Aberdeen receipt is again facsimile. What is missing? Oh no, here they are. I thought this was missing, but here it is. Okay, so here is just a different way of presenting this information. 
Here it says interesting to be checked and here it says so what? The comments here are check this out should be of interest and now what? This is again this example of how they change things for no reason but just because it moved from French from English to French back to English. So these articles are worded differently. Presumably they say the same basic thing, but you can see this one starts out, we have learned from a reliable source that a new unprecedented development project constructed by Mr. Je Jabez Balfour, and here it says a reliable source has made it known to this reporter that an announcement will be made public on Monday. So just everything is rewritten. All the text is rewritten because of the translation issues that it's just in a different voice, better for better or worse. Okay, so that's our evidence. It seems like exactly the same basic piece of evidence conveying the same basic information. You might look if his article is as nicely phrased, as, as funny as it is in his handwritten one, or the, the translation hurt. The game was rather dull. Hargrave, same as for the way he bats the ball, bowls the ball, delivering it in a right arm spin was called to the field. The 33rd series was starting, so Julius Benedict, who had the bat, never had to deal before with an adversary to an adversary such as this last Yorkshire miner whose control is beyond compare. First ball landed less than three feet. And here he says, the game was progressing slowly when Hargreave, the Google bowler, was brought on. It was the 39th over. Sir Julius Benedict, the batsman, had obviously never experienced quite the control that this rough coal miner from Yorkshire had over the ball. I think so far, we've just looked a little bit, but uh, it wouldn't surprise me if I didn't prefer the original writing. Okay. Let's put this evidence back in its envelope, which I've lost, so I'll just put aside. All right. We've looked already at the a new one has the normal rules and allies, and then one page of special rules for the Queen's Park, which says everything that our original said except three days, otherwise all the same. Let me check in with the chat, see if I'm missing anything. They're just talking about... I started to use my Space Cowboys version, became apparent quickly that there were big differences, so I stuck to screenshots. Differences at the beginning, dates, names of companies, most of the newspaper. AJ says, you'll notice the Space Cowboys omits Lord Goodwin completely, thus cutting down several clue points and events from the original. I'm glad we went with the original then, AJ. It definitely seems like we made the right decision to go with the original, which should be said was Jonathan's decision. Jonathan was the one who said... I'd like to do the original, and that's what we did. AJ says, I guess the new creators thought it was too long and windy, too. I think it might be the smoother experience. I'm glad the original got documented. Space Cowboys doesn't say you can play the days over. I think it does. Let's take a look. I think it does. Oh, you might be right. I do not see anything about playing days over. This seems to want you to play it by the rules. At the end of three days, read the end of the last booklet, then the questions, then the answers, and home solutions. Wow, I thought I read that you could play it, that it suggested. So if you go by this rules, you're going to have a much shorter, briefer, Probably unpleasant experience. That's kind of, yeah, that's not very pleasant. All right, let's compare the Queen's Park map. So I've compared this before. Here's the one that comes in the new version. Considerably smaller, uh, but easier to read the numbers. St. Legend formatted differently. 
There are changes here, I noticed, when I was considering whether we should use the new map. There are a couple of changes in entries here. I can't remember exactly what I found that was different, but there were some for sure. Most of them seemed meaningless, but some of them could be important. There was one weird place, 81, that we didn't find on the legend at all. I'm not sure if it's here either. We're not going to take a detailed look at it, but it's essentially the same. Essentially the same with the numbers in the same places. I don't see much different. Although Jonathan noted that they wrote on the old one, maybe some lots that had changed that were up here. Do we see any of those lots? Where were they? I think they were there, weren't they? And Jonathan's scan was different than my map. It had some lots indicated up near somewhere in the upper left. I don't see those indicated here, so I'm, I guess they decided not to carry those over. John says, the big empty lot, lots in our Queens Park seem like they've been developed by the time they got here. That's interesting. Yes, they do look developed. Okay, moving along. We've got three newspapers for the three days. Let's see if there's any pattern we can see to these. We have some experience with the Space Cowboys rewriting and moving stuff around in the newspapers. They look pretty... Can, they look pretty small, like they're not super dense compared to some of the Sherlock Holmes papers have tons more information. But let's just take a look here. Wednesday, September 3rd, September 5th, 4th. Okay, so there's the order this way. 3rd, 4th, and 5th. Let's see if any of our big stories line up on certain days. So day one is Paul Mall Gazette. All right. Here we had a story about what was relevant for us here. The safes have an art have a ad. Lethan Roth safe. Help stop thief. Help the best Lethan Roth safes. Fire, burglars, fire, the finest from Leith and Sons, Anchor Reliance Safes. Okay, so same article there. Same article from Jameson. Actually, I'm not sure Jameson had an article in our first paper. He's got an article in this one, but not here. There's our Parliament article. Uh, do we have an article about the dead body? Yeah, that's there. Jewels stolen. That's the same. Charrington article, similar. Peter Northrop article. I guess we've got more here. There's, there's our Peter Northrop article. Okay, and then, oh, and there's the Jameson article on the second page. So two pages condensed into one full page. Looks like all the important articles are there. It looks like they might have skipped some articles that aren't related to the case on billiards. No advertisement for carriage makers, it looks like. Which we did visit. Okay, that's article, that's paper one. Now in our second paper, in the original game, was almost nothing related. We noted there was almost nothing in our second paper related. So I guess that's what they probably got rid of. They probably got rid of this useless paper. That sort of made us think it might be related to the cipher. We had only an article about Sir Henry Cole. So there's the Sir Henry Cole's article. 
But then there's the article, there's the advertisement for the carriage. Lambert store jewelry. Okay, well, that was in our second paper. So, so far, I guess this feels like Henry Cole and Lambert. Okay, so it feels like this is still day two paper. So then how is it that day three and four get condensed into one? Let's see. So our day three paper was the Police Gazette. Okay, Police Gazette, Police Gazette. Body discovered in Queens Park. The letter from the dead man. Man falling to his death. Okay, this looks like day three. Looks like a copy of day three. They've taken some of the illustrations. They've used this one, this one. They did away with this one. <laughs> All right, and that's it. So just no day four paper. What did we read in day four? A whole bunch of interesting stuff. We worried about the boxing ring. No, that was still on day three, boxing ring of the Police Gazette. Mm, okay, I guess this was the boxing. No, this was the shooting. Lloyd Perkins found dead. Do we have an article on Perkins? Did we have an article on Perkins in this paper, day three paper? I don't think we did. The new version has an article on Perkins found dead. Uh, I know we saw that somewhere. That may have been in day four, though. Yes, okay, so in day four of our paper, Perkins is dead. Here they've thrown it back into day three. What about Josh O'Rourke being arrested? Don't see it. And then, so no article on Josh O'Rourke that I can see. And then, we had that long side story about the woman drowned. I guess the day four newspaper didn't contain that much of interest. Just Lloyd Perkins, and they threw that into day three. And then Goodwin got killed. As A.J. Hunter points out, that just was skipped. Okay, so not that much here, but it just looks like day three and day four got combined into this newspaper on day three. All right. Papers are smaller, like the original's better. Uh, I don't know. I think those are fine. Okay, now, before we look at this, someone was saying, we were saying about some minor hints. Well, actually, I printed this out. I didn't go through it because I knew we weren't playing the new one. But someone, Board Game Geek user Luke Van Rin, posted some suggestions for playing Queen's Park Affair and getting the most out of it. Let's take a look at what they said here. If you've pl we've played it and found it to be the most difficult and frustrating of the lot. Some sleuths report successful playthroughs despite its challenges, and you might too. We offer these five suggestions for a more enjoyable experience with this campaign. So someone has done the quick, quick and dirty Solutions to enjoying it more. Check the unofficial errata thread. I don't, I haven't seen that, so I'm not sure what that is. Holmes does not believe in coincidences. Check your priorities. Time is of the essence. What's in a name? Okay, check the unofficial errata. A compiled list of errata. We might check this afterwards for fun to see what space errata is on Space Cowboys. Garden Road should be Harleston Road. Some problems with the directory. Derek Vincent should be WC. Miss Stop Stoper should be Miss Gardner. Uh, okay, it looks like the London directory. We actually encountered this. When I was going back and forth with the new directory, I noticed I couldn't find Alice Gardner. Looks like their name was changed in the new version, so you might have had a hard, harder time finding her. Missing entries. So there's no directory for the ring. 
No directory for Rollins or Milton Simmons. And then some translation errors. Bowler ends up on the ground. Batsman ends up on the ground. The firm of land investments got misspelled. Do you know why? Didn't have a no in it. Spelling error. Agnes Bradford was pregnant. Should be Agnes Duff was pregnant. Looks like they changed the name Bradford to Duff of Miss Belfour. 70 upper Thames should be 66. Spelling about Mr. Shand should be Mr. Shank. We encountered very little bugs in this game, just a few. The missing article, letter written by a deceased, can be found in the Police Gazette on September 5th. This is the news of my death that Vincent note, Vincent's note to Holmes refers to. Hmm. Not sure what that's about. Uh, Shand is Shank again. London's an immense jigsaw puzzle. You may have one piece, all the others are affected by it. There are lots of events and threads to keep track of, but you would be unwise to dismiss any of them out of hand. Throughout the campaign takes place over three days. Not all of the leads behave like it. Some leads give you the same information every day. Others are highly time sensitive. As your to-do list grows, try to prioritize the leads that seem most urgent. Dead body will still be dead on Friday. Time is of the essence. Constructing a timeline can help you piece together the case. Hopefully you have an Anna or a Jonathan in your group that can help work out your timelines. Characters obey the travel time scale. Photocopy of the driver's log can help you trace individuals' movements. Jabez Balfour's feelings may be deliberately opaque, but you shouldn't suffer. Be careful to distinguish between these two businesses, broker's firm of land versus firm of land investments. You will hear a lot about temperance movements and army of hope. These are one and the same. In other words, don't try to find the army of hope. Okay, well, not much, not much aid here, although the errata may help. I mean, these may be important fixes. Uh, they don't, certainly doesn't address any of the issues we had or our suggestions or any suggestions to not play by the time rules. Um, okay. She says, I noticed some difference in day one and day two, but day three was a condensed version of day three and day four. I see. Okay. So here we go. Here's our day one, day two, and day three in the new version. So day one is the shortest. And then day two and day three look super long. Let's just look at what the introductions look like. It's, it, I'm tempted to like look at one just to get a feel. I think maybe, oh, I think I may have gotten rid of my notes about where my favorite sections were. I mean, I know what they were, but at some point I had them on a card. It would be nice to sort of read the sections that I found the most written the best to see how the new version compares. Let me see if I have it over here. I have a couple here, not my super favorites, but a couple that we might check out. All right, let's just glance through it and look at, appreciate some of the art. Now, so remember, you have no clue points here. So you just say, okay, we want to go to something, something QP, and you'd look it up. QP comes first, then comes Northwest, whatever. Okay, so let's look at already, uh, this seems unpleasant to me. Like, if you were looking up 25 QP, you'd find it here, and you'd already know these are irrelevant. Do you think they changed the times to give you more time? Where's our 11 QP? 11 QP. I guess we gotta, we'd have to do a double lookup. It's nice you don't have to do the double lookups with the new version. You just go to the neighborhood. 11 here. Let's just take a look at a couple. We're going to do like what they would call a spot check. So here's Jabez. Well, this one suggests in the new one, this is a longer entry when you meet Jabez. Takes 25 minutes here, 30 minutes here. 
Although that was day, I believe that's the same day four. Oh no, it's different. The first, first entry is 45. Let's just see. We're doing some spot checks to see if they've reduced the times of things to make it give you more time. Day one, QP, 43. Okay. So here's the day one entry for QP when we first meet Balfour to compare. Here it is here. Here it is here. 30 minutes, 30 minutes. Same thing. Let's read this little dialogue to see. In the new one, he says, in the old one, he says, go ahead, close the deal. I know what I said yesterday, but that was yesterday. I can't go into that now. I'll call you later. Belfort hangs up the receiver and turns his attention to us. Sorry to hold you up. I love the telephone. Don't know what I did before we had them. Now, what can I do for you? You said you were the private detectives working for Sherlock Holmes. Did my wife contact him? We say no. Now, well, just a matter of time, she'll call every detective in the city. She has her telephones, too. Mr. Holmes doesn't. Well, that's surprising. I thought he called himself a scientific detective. He's a scientific detective. He just doesn't find a need for a telephone. Well, if you're not here to track down my wife's stolen jewels, why are you here? We're trying to track down Franklin Kearney. Good. I've been worried about him myself. How can I help you? Before we can answer, one of his telephone rings. Excuse me. Balfour, yes. Okay. Meet me at the bank at 830. Appointment's at 9, so don't be late. And he says, pardon the interruption. Okay, now let's see what he's, how the new one is phrased. Uh, okay, he's on the phone. Do, do it. Finalize the deal. I know what I said yesterday, but that was yesterday. I can't give any more details for the time being. I'll call you back. Belfort hangs up and addresses us. Sorry to have made you wait. I enjoy telephones so much. I don't know how I survived until I got them. So what can I do for you? You told me you are private de investigators and that you work for Sherlock Holmes. Did my wife get in touch with him? No. Well, it's only a matter of time. She will go see each detective in London. She, too, has telephones. Not Mr. Sherlock Holmes. He says, that's surprising. I thought he considered himself a scientific detective. Well, he's a scientific detective, but he does not feel the need to have a telephone. Well, if you aren't here to look for my wife's jewels, why did you come? We're trying to find Franklin Kearney. Wonderful. Me, too. I'm worried about him. How can I help you? Before we can answer, one of his telephones starts ringing. Excuse me, Balfour here. Yes, all right. Meet you at the bank at 8.30. The appointment is at 9 o'clock. Don't be late. Please forgive me for the disruption. All right, it's very similar. I think by for my ears, I like the original better. Anna says, I'm looking at the 3... SC version. There's Lord Goodwin in this one as well, and he was also blown up. So the story is here. They just cut him out of the cricket team. Interesting. All right, going back through this one. There was this old madman walking his dog. He looked for Northrop with us. He was always under our feet. His dog's name was Toby. Here's a drawing of something near one of the breweries, I think. Oops. So we got a drawing of Sherlock Holmes, then a drawing of one of the breweries. That was Thiexon Brewery. That looks like Holmes. It is not yet 1 p.m. As of 1 p.m. Try to meet Langdale Pike. So this is a nice way to do it. Here they don't make you branch and jump from one to another. You stay here at 2 Southwest and you just read this one before one and this one after one. I like that. Rather than having to track down branches, this makes it easier to ignore time information. You're just like, okay, I'll read this, now I'll read this. It also makes it hard to avoid accidentally reading it, too. 
This looks like maybe Watson reading something. Look at these are great illustrations. Here's the Pinkerton guy saying he Kearney came in to ask him to do some investigations. Uh, he was supposed to come back on Tuesday for the results. He didn't show up. Can we see them? He says, nope. Who is this with a knife? Who is this? It's not this lead. I'm not sure who this is meant to be. Here's the cab log. Maybe it's just a generic picture. Look at this cab log. Holy cow. You can see it's interesting. It's done in American times. It goes to 8, 15 p.m. Hey, look, here's a difference. These look like they like, might even be longer, but look, I see a big difference. What do you notice here? Oh, look, there are multiple days, Jonathan. This is September the 1st. Here's the logbook for Monday and Tuesday. Okay, so here are the first two logbooks on the first day. You get these two. But now look, what, what do you notice is different? There's a huge difference here. That would save you a huge amount of time. They're giving you the neighborhoods they're in, so you don't have to find them. That's a huge time saver. That is a huge time saver. Okay, here are the land records. Look pretty much the same. I gotta fix my cubes in this view. Okay, this was the restaurant seating. Not very useful to us. Um, most of the dialogues seems the same. It's just a little more stilted and artificial in the new versions. And in the old versions, they seem to do a better job of capturing the dialect to me. Anna, what do you think about that? I'd like to maybe read another one of my favorite ones if I can find it to see how it compares. Here's the little map of Toby. It's at the same location, 6EC. I wonder how you figure out that that's Toby. Here was one of my favorite entries, although it was rather procedural about the mint. So maybe this isn't the best one to read. The best one to read to get a feel for the dialogue or the characters you're talking to that are like the safe cracker and stuff. But here he is telling us about the mint. Can you tell us the events that led up to Northrop's arrest? You had the ability to copy anything. It's the papers done so carefully. Northrop was also in charge of the maintenance of the Royal Maces. He was a master goldsmith who was to check the ceremony maces each time they were used. He worked at the tower and came across the five pound note. Another generic 
drawing of someone looking through the thing, maybe. Alice Gardner, he's getting married to her. Here's another timed entry. Not that many timed entries. Here's a drawing that looks like it's for Queens Park. It's like Queens Park real estate drawing. Cricket ball. Okay, that was day one. An illustration of Balfour you saw, that would have been fun. It would have been fun to see some illustrations of some people. So here are our new letters that we got at the start of the case. I like the idea. The idea of having a new booklet for each day does seem like it might be a little more satisfying. There's Holmes as a, mo it feels like a distinctively modern Holmes, like a tough guy. I still like Basil Rathbone better. Here's Lomax in the library. You know, in a game, if it was a game where these characters weren't written out so wonderfully with all their dialogue, the pictures might be more important. They're kind of cool here, but on the other hand, it's like seeing pictures of the people in the radio play. It just doesn't seem so important. And it says, how do you notice that the address was typed here? That's a great point. In our old case, it was significant that his note was typed. Maybe it describes it. I received this morning. It was possible to get in talk to whether or not this letter comes from one world or another is most interesting. No mention of typed letter. All right, that little subtle detail was thrown out the window. Here's the one where we get history on Belfort being a boxer. Here's the White Eagle where we talk to the guy who was the safe robber. That's where Jaffe go talk to him. Let me see how this reads. After giving us his vice, he takes the one pound note and walks to a patron seat. Actually, this was a little bit subtle. We talked to the bartender. Remember this part at the White Eagle where we talked to him, we asked him for information, and he says something subtle about, like, I want, I only share information with people who I can trust, who are honest about how they're going to use it. And then he walks away and comes back. I know Porky well. Okay. Well, as your Porky's friends, you're welcome here, Hank. Okay. We can say, uh, Wiggins lays a one pound banknote on the counter. I'm going to fetch the change. No need, Hank. Am I mistaken? Or are you looking for more than beer? And he says, Wiggins, my friends, he's going to say, my friends call me something. And he says, well, for now, one name is enough. So Mr. Wiggins, let me give you a piece of advice. Hank leans his head towards us and lowers his voice. From time to time, there are friends who come looking for information. Sometimes I have an answer, sometimes I haven't. And when I haven't the response, it's because I don't know why the guy asked the question or what he wants to do with the answer. When you ask a question, I suppose you want to hear the truth. That's all I want, guys. Maybe someday I'll have a question for you, too. All right, that's reasonably close. And he sends this to Jaffe. Where are Jaffe? What's the matter? Who are you? Is the professor who sends you tell him it's not me? I don't have the jewels. I couldn't force the safe. I didn't have time to burn it. I don't know who has the jewels. I don't even know 
that there were jewels in the safe. Tell the professor I couldn't take the papers. I couldn't open it. I told him right from the beginning I didn't think I'd be able to pull it off. It's not my type of gig. He knew it. I told him. All right, reasonable. This looks like another generic illustration. More timed entries. Here, if you visit Parliament, you can choose to visit Roger Peel, Gallery of Visitors. So in ours, you had to branch off. This one makes it a little easier to just glance and say, okay, we want to go there. In fact, in ours, we had to make a choice before we saw it was blank or not. This one, you can see, oh, there's a lot to be learned from here. I'm going to him. Here looks like Meeks. Meeks or Murray? Murray, I guess it is. Okay, this was Vincent Derrick's Rose giving us the letter he wrote about the horses. Who is this? I don't know who this is supposed to be. Some generic entry? Lambert. Nice illustration of something. I don't know what, though. Ward Goodwin is evacuating town. More cab logs. Look at this. These are the criminal records. A little more colorfully illustrated than the simple list we got in the old version. That's pretty nice. Here's the plots again. So one interesting thing, actually this is kind of fascinating. Because each day is broken up into books in the new version, if you want to have a lead that's the same on day one, day two, day three, etc., which there are a lot of them in this game, you have to reproduce them and cop duplicate them in each book. Whereas they can all share the same address in the old version. So some of these we're seeing multiple times. Like we saw this in a small version on the previous book. This is Toby's map. It's kind of weird. Here is the cipher. And here is the etching. Report expected. Johnny wants 50 pounds brandy at 11 a.m. So same information, just presented slightly differently. Here's the madame. There's an illustration of madame. That's pretty impressive. Here's Armand's office. Blood on the way out. We noticed something odd. The tea lady left in a hurry. She has a little car she pushes and she goes around all the office buildings. She brings tea and cookies to workers. Usually I help her put her little cart back onto the car when she's finished. She often gives me some tea before leaving. Wednesday, the tea lady left without a word. When I tried to help her, she pushed me back, grabbed the cart as if it was weightless. Then she left. 
pulling her car to full throttle. The other weird stuff is that she has not come back since. He doesn't say she's been working there for a few weeks, and it's again awkward, a little bit awkwardly phrased. I think there's a little bit of French translation to English that's a little bit more awkward. This is interesting. That was the, uh, so how do you notice the address? We're still on that, okay. All right, here's day three. So let us let you know I'm doing fine. I'll explain in my return. Here's a change. Oh no, this is the letter this is the letter about the prison woman. It looks like it's different. The prison breakout letter from the wife looks different. Hope as well. The children and I are doing fine. We miss you a lot. Your friend James thought that you might like to read this poem that we will publish on Sunday. No weird thing about Sunday the 3rd. Here she says, The trees, the green grass, and the sky as shelters. Choose the right moment and then fly away. For such are the pleasures when the fall is like embers. Choose the right moment. The others are at play. May the birds fly and the dogs, the dog hollers. The lark on Sunday will be overjoying. Your heart will guide you. The path is adjoining. Where the old oak tree meets the donkeys that bray. Okay, a little different rewrite. Not sure why. Maybe to make it rhyme. Here's Colin Kennedy. Boxer, maybe. Buying some beer at Porky's, possibly. Here's the... The letter from Vincent Derrick that the daughter shows us. Remember, a lot of duplicate entries. Here's a little illustration of generic of Sherlock Holmes thinking. Here's catalogs for Thursday and Friday. So if you hadn't checked the catalogs, uh, look, if you wish to have access to the logbook for Monday and Tuesday, look up lead 5WC of the day one booklet. So this is sending you to the other booklets if you wanted to go find these leads in the previous booklet. Here's another duplication of the criminal logs. Duplication of the land records. Duplication of that restaurant. So what a duplication in these books. Duplication of Toby's map again. Here's the meeting with O'Rourke. They say, what do you want from me? Someone saw you throw the body in the canal. I'm telling you, I ain't the killer. Tell that to the hangman. I won't be hanged. This cockiness is starting to fade away. This was our long entry where he eventually confessed or told us who was behind it all. These damn aristocrats couldn't care less about guys like me. I work myself to death for a few pence a day, and I must say thank you, sir. Yes, sir, your lordship. I'm going to kiss your arse, and I'll say, still say thank you, sir. And all the while, I must watch my children live on bread and potatoes while the children of those bastards bleed my country dry. Kill my brother. They pulled me and my family from the land on which my old man and his old man were buried. 
so that a ward can hunt those damn foxes. No, guys, these damn bastards don't give a toss about people like me, that I know. That's reasonably written. Josh, we want to help you. We can understand your royalty. I was on a cigarette. Okay, reasonably written. Here's another woman here. These illustrations are not like placed right near the paragraphs where they're used. Here's a repeated talk with Madame. Here's our biographies, including one for Ward Goodwin, Ward Perkins. A final last picture of Holmes. Okay. I'm curious to find Luella. Where was Luella? Was it 96 EC in our case? She doesn't seem to be here in this case. There's no Luella entry. We'd have to look up. Before we read the solution, let's see where, if Lloyd Perkins' ma men entry ma mentions Luella. So it was 47 EC was where Pickering, Picker lived, I think, and got killed. We find Lloyd Perkins' house at Scotland Yard. Too late. So by the time you get here, it's too late to find him. What about here? It's certainly easier to look up things in these new books. Okay, let's see. So if you find Lord Perkins, there's nothing else on the floor but a letter opener and the silver frame port photograph of a young woman with affection Luella is written on the photograph. We rummage through the drawers. So Luella is still mentioned. How would you find Luella? And I mean, she's mentioned in here, but how would you find her? How would you find that entry? That's kind of weird, huh? Maybe it's got a different ending. That doesn't involve Luella. It would be near Shanks Brewery. Let's see if there's a different way to find Luella. Maybe that's Luella. Ormond the Beheaded, Perkins the Suicide. This one seems to be referring to Ormond as the person who's beheaded. I wonder if they didn't change and have Ormond killed. I guess we'll read it in the solution. I'm just quickly looking for any other, for Luella being somewhere else. I do not see any other Luella. Okay, let's read our questions and see if they're any different. Who is responsible for the disappearance of Franklin Kearney and why? 
Did Ormond kill Cole? What happened to Ormond? Who stole the, stole the jewels? What became of them? Who killed Jocelyn? Who killed Leland? Who killed Lily? Leo Mill, sorry. Lloyd Perkins was in Two People Pay. Again, an awkward English sentence here. Not awkward, incorrect translation. I think they would get the questions right. Who sent Holmes the letter? Who killed Peter Northrop? Who ordered his murder? Where are the bank plates? Who organized the bombing? Why? Okay, questions are exactly the same, right? Questions seem exactly the same to me. 11 questions, exactly the same. Okay, let's see the solution. Let's just skim it and look for changes. He takes some tobacco from the Oriental Slipper. It should be Persian Slipper. How does it feel, Mr. Kearney, you have played the pawn in a chess game? Disputed by two great forces of evil reigning over London. He says it was quite an unsettling experience. I'm still whiteheaded. Okay, anyway. Uh, okay. James Moriarty and Belfour. This looks all the same. How do you know there was so no danger? And why didn't you tell us? He says, I'm going to ignore the second question. Why didn't tell you? But the intruder could have couldn't have been himself because he wouldn't have come in through the window. I don't know if that doesn't make sense to me, but that's all right. He sent someone to fetch his items. Okay, so far so good. A young woman knocked on my door to tell me that my dear Alice wanted to see me immediately. This may seem stupid of me, but I didn't ask anything. So he still goes with the young woman. Taken to a cellar that smelled of hop and malt, so at the brewery, he met the professor. So same exact story, but that Luella clue didn't seem to be there. So I don't know how you would learn that. I think I know where the plates are. We say they're in the house of come, the mace, so it's all the same. The jackal's shrewdness is quite admirable, so is his dexterity. Ormond's murder, which he committed quite brilliantly, had nothing to be ashamed of in comparison to the Machiavellianism deployed by Moriarty in its planning. And we say, Ormond's murder? I thought that Cole had been murdered by Ormond. Cole, him too, was murdered, of course. That's where the genius lays. Moriarty managed to eliminate the two parliamentarians who stood in the way of his breweries and public houses. Follow my reasoning. As Ormond had not killed Cole 20 years old earlier, when passions were in a fury, he had no reason to do so nowadays. And why the morbid ending? The response can be found at Tetley and Butler. Only Mr. Cole's head was identified, head that Johnny, the new tea lady, had put in the place of Mr. Ormond's. The body had Mr. Ormond's clothes, so it was Ormond's body. That is how Moriarty got rid of two adversaries, explaining the disappearance of one by the murder of the other. Now you can understand why there was that blood in the hat box, Wiggins. And you, Mr. Kearney, can now appreciate the luck you've had. So same exact story. Only Mor uh, Moriarty could have stolen the French explosives that blew up Goodwin and the cricket club. He wanted to eliminate his rival. We never learned how they figured out it was Perkins that was the spy. Um, Jaffe couldn't open the safe. He took the opportunity. He stole them. They stole the jewels back, etc., etc. So it was Balfour who killed Perkins because he was tipping off Moriarty. Indirectly, Watson, in reality, the instrument of, was Sir Miller Brandon, who was to meet Perkins at 11 on the day of his demise. Clearly, his knowledge of cryptography was far from yours, for you, otherwise he never would have left the coded message. 
doesn't still tell us how he discovered Perkins was a spy. Uh, and he asked about the message and Rose copied it. So exactly same solutions and epilogue. And if we look at the solutions, we see So here Moriarty wants to gain information from Kearney. Our explanation was a little bit more like he wanted to plan ideas or whatever. Otherwise, exactly the same. So stories the same, endings the same. Crew points are a little more awkwardly written. Seems like you really don't have time to solve this if you only get three days. And I'd love to know how you find Luella. The day four intro is not the same. That's a good point. Day four, let's see. Day three here we get told about Franklin writes a letter saying I'm fine. And day four is Holmes is smelling like horses. This day three is the letter. I guess you don't need to know that Holmes is smelling like horses. Here Gregson tells you about arresting O'Rourke. And in day three, he mentions the, the biography places. Okay, so, I mean, day four introduction doesn't say much in the old original version, so I guess it didn't have to say much in the new one. Well, okay, it looks like they've just maybe combined most of the day four new clues and just put them in day three. The only weird, the writing's a little worse. Not, not too worse though, as long as you can overlook a little bit. The only weird thing was that we found so far, of course we didn't read all the details, but the fact that Luella is missing is weird. The end story still involves a woman doing that, but we don't know how you find her. Or where her clue is. Seem to have misplaced my solution. I'll do it later. Any other thoughts? Essentially, same game. They did not change the ending. They did not change the solution. They did not change the questions. That's kind of surprising to me. I thought they would have added some questions. They made the cabs easier to decode. They added a question about the cipher. They didn't add a question about the cipher, but you're saying they added a comment about how to solve the cipher. I don't remember if the new one did that. A little bit about the hat box. They removed the rule saying you can replay a day, which seems insane. I wonder how you would find Luella. It'll be interesting to go look at some of the threads on Board Game Geek. There are almost no threads from the original game. Almost everyone is commenting on playing the new one. And it will be interesting to go now and read some Board Game Geek threads about people who have played the Queen's Park Affair new version. It would be very easy to play this. Like, because it's different from ours, because of things like this where when you go somewhere it shows you the before 3 p.m. and after it would be very easy for people to read both of these and not and cheat almost with no effort with ours we have to cheat quite a bit if we want to do that which we actually didn't 
do. Maybe we did it once or twice. And we read some of the key entries that were most interestingly written, most compellingly written. And those seem to be also in, well written in the new version, although with little bits of English translation wrong. And it says you just skipped it, Jesse. What did I skip? What did I skip? The solution. I found it. I found it, if that's what you're talking about. But no... Nowhere to find Luella. That's very weird. Maybe Luella is not at 96 anymore. Let's see if she's still in... Her last name was Carnes. Luella Carnes is 96 EC, so she's still at the same address. So the same Luella is not in this book. Not in case three. There's a question on the question list about the cipher. Oh, I see. There is. And I missed it. Oh, 7A. So they did. Instead of saying, the old one said, Lloyd Perkin was in the employ of what two people, A and B. So they did change that question. They changed the question to be, Lloyd Perkin was in the it was in two people pay. Who are these two people? It's a badly written English, but seven A asked you to name both people, and then seven B says how to decipher the message. So the new one does ask you to prove you can decipher the message. That's good. That's an improvement. Okay, good. Boy, how is Anna good at so good at spotting these things? Well, what do you think? If you had to do it over again, would you rather have played the old version or the new version? Seems like a no-brainer to me that the old version was more enjoyable to play. And it's time to wrap up here as I get your final answers here. So uh, we can talk about the movies another a day. I'll give you guys another week to watch those three movies. Big Short, To Live and Die in L.A., and Before the Devil Knows You're Dead. Uh, I don't know if Anna will watch those. Anna says, <laughs> Anna says the new version is total garbage. That's a pretty harsh take. What makes you say that, Anna? What makes you say the new version is total garbage? <laughs> it's pretty harsh. I don't think I'd go that far. Just because it's shorter? Or you think the entries are written? And it says, I'm not surprised people don't like it. Um, but on what basis are you saying that different? They don't look that different. They don't seem that different to me. Writing, subtly worse. Shorter game. That I don't like. I don't know how to explain the Luella. But it seems like a shorter, more condensed game. But essentially, the puzzle is exactly the same. The mystery is the same. I'm not sure on what basis I would say it's, it's that much different. Of course, we'd have to look at more of the clues to see if anything got shortcutted. All right, Jonathan is saying thanks. I'm saying I say thanks to you guys as well. All right, well, if you're watching this later, or if Anna or Jonathan or anyone else has additional comments, please do post them on this video or on Board Game Geek in the Queen's Park Affair forum section or on the... Board Game Geek Guild for this YouTube channel, Co-op for Two Guild, which you can find a link to on the YouTube community tab. I do hope that some of the other people, as Jonathan was saying, some of the other people who joined us for most of these streams, Megan and Shazner, I wouldn't mind hearing more thoughts from Antina as well, and AJ, I'd like to hear more of your thoughts um, after you get a chance to watch this. And it says, rule change, fewer newspapers, bad translation, they left out clues, didn't fix anything that was problematic. It does look like they didn't fix anything that was problematic. 
That is the weirdest thing. And it says, I did watch the movies, though. Okay, any thoughts? How would you rank the three movies? Now, we, better talk, we should talk about that later. It's already four, four hours and 40 minutes in. All right, just tell me, which Jonathan, did you get a chance to watch the movies yet? All right, we should. This is, this is exactly what I said we shouldn't do. I still need to catch up. All right, we're going to have our movie discussion later. Thanks for joining me. What a pleasure and a special experience it was to be able to share these games with you all. And it was really fun. It was brain burning. It was exhausting and bittersweet because it's gone. We can't play it again, at least for 20 more years. Maybe we'll meet up again in 20 years and play these again when we've forgotten everything. I'll see you in the next video.